<laughs> so uh, welcome everyone uh, uh, to this virtual ICTS uh, program, uh, which is uh, on advances in applied probability. In, uh, in some sense, it's a sort of a follow up or a, a building on the previous uh, program that was held on ICTS campus about a year and a half ago, uh, which was a very successful program. And uh, many of the same organizers are uh, uh, are uh, have put this uh, program together as well uh, in an online format, uh, given the current uh, situation. Uh, so I want to firstly thank all the organizers uh, for putting together what seems like a very uh, exciting program with uh, excellent speakers uh, and so on. So. Um, uh, uh, and uh, this was done also at relatively short notice. We approached many of the program organizers who had put together successful programs at ICTS uh, to uh, see whether they were interested in uh, putting together a, a kind of a follow-up uh, program and something that would sort of bring the same community together in these uh, isolated times. Um, so I'm glad that uh, this has worked out uh, for this particular program. And um, for those of you who are joining for the first time uh, for an ICTS program, uh, I hope this will not be the last. And in fact, I hope that you will be able to come to ICTS campus for one of our actual programs. and. Uh, uh, once things get better, which uh, hopefully this new year uh, will uh, bring uh, good uh, tidings on that front. Um, so uh, uh, ICTS is a center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. It's one of the newest centers. It is based in Bangalore and we have a, a nice campus uh, which is uh, geared towards organizing programs. That is one of the unique mandates of the ICTS. Each center of TIFR has a sort of a unique character. So uh, apart from the in-house research that our faculty do, uh, one of the unique characteristics is uh, having programs in mathematics, theoretical physics, computer science, quantitative biology related areas. Uh, and uh, the way we do this is uh, like many of our peer institutions uh, elsewhere in the world, like MSRI or in physics, KITP, uh, et cetera, which is we have a online program proposal system. And uh, we encourage academics from anywhere across the world to put together a proposal and submit it. There's a template and it's a simple um, proposal system. And uh, we have a program committee which meets uh, and uh, evaluates all the proposals and uh, decides uh, on uh, supporting uh, a chosen few of them. Uh, the ones that we feel will are of course of very high quality, but also keeping in mind uh, sort of a breadth across uh, different disciplines uh, and so on. So that's the way our program uh, proposal system works. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and uh, uh, now, of course, due to this situation from uh, March, we have not had in-person programs. And so we have sort of kept the program proposal. I mean, the, the portal is still open and accepts proposals, but we have uh, kept on hold the evaluation and the uh, scheduling of programs till the situation becomes a little clearer. In fact, there's a backlog of programs which we will be sort of, um, we have therefore have had to sort of uh, push the schedule uh, further. And uh, it's likely that uh, we will be able to uh, accept new in-person programs only from um, middle or uh, late 2022. Um, uh, so we hope to start programs again in late summer 2021 of this year, uh, uh, assuming everything goes well and people feel more comfortable in traveling. Uh, we hope that will uh, begin again, but uh, uh, um, we'll, we'll see. But then there will be a sort of a backlog of the programs that were supposed to have been held. Some of them couldn't be held in virtual format. So we'll uh, be holding them in person on campus and uh, sort of clearing that. and but we'll also restart the pro uh, process of evaluating fresh proposals. So I encourage people uh, to um, uh, explore the possibility. 
And uh, once a proposal is accepted, the ICTS staff and the infrastructure is geared for organizing the program so that the program organizers essentially have to take care only of the academic aspects uh, to identify the speakers, the content of the program, the schedule, and, and so on. Um, the thing that will make academically the best, uh, have the best outcome. So uh, it takes away a lot of the organizational burden from, uh, from people who want to put this program together. And, um, and uh, so, uh, so that's uh, one of the aspects. ICTS also has its own in-house uh, research in mathematics, theoretical physics, uh, and we um, uh, would like to expand into other areas, uh, including in computer science and uh, various topics in applied mathematics and uh, 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 and. Uh, uh, quantitative biology as well. Uh, so, uh, so we are also looking for bright young faculty. Uh, so that's something you can also find on our web page, the process for applying for positions. We also have an active postdoctoral program and graduate student program uh, uh, in uh, mathematics. We have just begun theoretical physics uh, has been uh, going on for a while. Uh, we have close connections to the other Bangalore centers like the Center for Applied Mathematics CAM as well as the NCBS, the Center for Biological Sciences. So, uh, and of course the larger TIFR system and the Indian science community. So um, that's um, more or less what I had to say on uh, about ICTS. And uh, I hope all of you have a stimulating meeting. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the schedule for this meeting is from 5.30 PM to the late evening every day by Indian time. Uh, uh, I think that's one of the nice things about uh, this format that uh, the timings have been flexible such that one can accommodate uh, various time zones uh, fairly well. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm happy that uh, there are some positives uh, to this. And the large number of participants, 150, I'm, I believe, and uh, is also something we are normally hard pressed to accommodate on campus in an actual program. So in a sense, uh, this uh, virtual format has helped to uh, broaden the participation. And for the younger people, I encourage people to participate actively through uh, and ask questions and everything and make the best of the opportunity given the uh, the excellent speakers. So with that, let me hand it over to the organizers and uh, uh, have a great week and a great year. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, so I'll just take a couple of minutes and then we'll start with our first lecture. Uh, first of all, I just want to tell everybody, I uh, thank Rajesh, uh, you know, for helping, uh, for allowing us to organize this. ICTS is a wonderful uh, campus. Uh, we had a great experience last time. So it's, uh, and even now it's been very smooth. So it's uh, very pleasant engaging with ICTS. So I'm welcoming formally everybody to this uh, sec program on advances in applied probability. It's second and online edition. Our first event happened in August, 2019. That was an ICTS campus in Bangalore. And there we had many short courses by leading experts and the aim was to popularize the emerging and the exciting broad area of applied probability within India, where it's traditionally been somewhat uh, underrepresented. Uh, this time the event is shorter, uh, it's more international and it's uh, certainly very exciting. Uh, so we have excellent researchers worldwide in the areas of statistical learning theory, including bandits, high dimensional probability, Monte Carlo methods, discrete and empirical probability, who will be presenting uh, short lectures, uh, well, uh, 45 to 50 minute lectures, uh, plus some question answers. Uh, we are enormously grateful to the speakers for agreeing to share the research at this forum. So with this, uh, you know, without taking any further time, let me start by introducing our first speaker. Now his work is so widely known that he really needs no introduction. Uh, Shai Manur has made outstanding contributions to the theory and practice of machine learning, reinforcement learning, bandits, stochastic optimization, and many other areas involving applications of probability and optimization. Personally speaking, I've read many of his papers and enjoyed the noble and beautiful ideas and connections made in them. Uh, briefly on his biography, so Shai's PhD is from Technion. He did his postdoc at MIT after which he joined McGill University as a faculty from 2004 to 2010. 
He's currently back in Technion as a professor. Today, he'll be speaking on risk and robustness in reinforcement learning, where as in life itself, nothing ventured means nothing gained. Shai. Thank you. Uh, so uh, actually, I was looking forward to uh, uh, being on, on campus, but uh, you know, in, the, in these times, uh, there's not much you can do. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. OK, thank you. So thank you for the introduction uh, and the warm uh, words. I'm going to talk about uh, risk and robustness in, uh, in RL. Uh, this, is, uh, um, and this is a work with many people. Uh, so I will not mention them in, during the talk. Um, and, um, and, and really, I'm going to, I know this is an applied probability uh, uh, audience. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, RL. So RL really is about uh, sequential decision maker. Here we see Tetris. Uh, in Tetris, as I'm sure you've all, you've all wasted lots of, uh, much, much time in your, during your youth. Uh, there are bricks falling and you need to clear uh, lines. Uh, whatever decision you're going to make, meaning whatever bricks are going to fall, are going to affect uh, what you can do uh, uh, sequentially. Um, perhaps the most successful uh, application of RL is in, uh, in, uh, in, in the stock market. So this is an American, uh, American put option. American put option has uh, um, a contract that gives its owner uh, the right to sell stock at the strike price K. So if the price is, is, is above K, uh, the option is, is valuable. If it's below K, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 there is no value to the option. And, and there are many questions in American output options, such as when to execute, but also, and perhaps more importantly, how to, eval how to value uh, uh, the option itself. Yet another example, this is a very simple ping pong little domain. So in ping pong domain, there is, a, uh, there is a, um, a blue ball and a red uh, dot. And your objective is to get the blue ball to the red uh, dot. And you can, uh, in this case, there are, are two paths you can choose. Uh, it's a pinball, so everything shakes all the time. So it's not such an easy uh, control task. Uh, you, can you can take the longest uh, path, which is uh, uh, safer, but will take longer. Or you can take the shorter path, but then you might hit the wall. If you hit the wall, then uh, you can re get reflected back. So you need to decide if you're going to take the safe route or the longest uh, route. And there are, of course, many uh, pinball uh, problems. So uh, I'm going to talk to, today about the classical uh, RL model. Uh, so we have an, 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 a Markov decision process, which we call an MDP. There is a controlling agent. There is a control environment uh, or a controlled entity. The agent uh, uh, observes some indication of the state and gets a reinforcement signal, the reward. And uh, as, a re as a result, the agent sort of figures out what to do and chooses an action that uh, is going to affect the controlled uh, entity. So this is a classical model. We have a state space S, a, a, a um, transition probability P, a reward function uh, R, and, uh, and a state, uh, state space uh, A. Uh, and it's very common in RL, we, uh, uh, the state space and the action space is known, are known. This is part of the problem. Um, but the transitions and the rewards uh, are not known. So we don't know the dynamics of the system. Uh, and we don't know uh, uh, what you're going to get. And the classical objective, which we'll discuss through, throughout most of this talk, is the uh, cumulative, uh, expected cumulative discounted uh, return. So basically, you're trying to find a policy that would, would give you the, the maximal uh, expected uh, uh, return. And I just want to mention uh, this famous uh, quote by Vox. Uh, uh, this is, of course, just a model. We don't pretend reality to be like that. This is just a model of, uh, of reality. OK. So what happened in the last five years or so, uh, uh, basically there, we have many, many algorithms and uh, you see the algorithm, uh, this is a taxonomy of the algorithms. I'm not going to get into it. There are broadly uh, uh, four families of algorithms. Uh, so we have many algorithms, uh, but we have uh, relatively few real world successes. Uh, the most recent one was, uh, I think, uh, DeepMind's uh, ability to uh, uh, control uh, balloons uh, floating through the atmosphere, but still we don't see many, su many successes. And the question is why? Why don't we see many successes? And what should we do to, uh, uh, to, make, uh, um, to make the RL work uh, a little bit better in the real world? Uh, so let me start with a um, um, uh, reductionist uh, fallacy. So uh, those are uh, three sentences I think everybody would agree with. So only smart people can play chess, for example, very well. I'm sure you agree that to be, to be a good chess player, you need to be uh, very smart. I'm sure you also agree that uh, almost everybody can tell a joke. Uh, and then, um, well, you also agree with the computers are really good at chess. I mean, definitely better than humans. 
So uh, the reductionist fallacy that because uh, uh, telling jokes are, is easy for humans and computers are very smart in, you know, in the sense that they play uh, chess, then uh, the logical conclusion must be that computer can easily tell a joke. I know how many jokes we've heard computer, uh, computers telling, but it's not very funny. Uh, so there is this uh, uh, notion that, that we're, when we think about problems, we're making reductionist fallacies. And we pretend that some uh, problems are much easier than uh, they really are. Um, this is um, uh, this alludes to a, um, to a book by uh, Jay Shito, who was uh, the MIT uh, Media Lab uh, director, and um, and basically uh, we we try we often we offer simplifying problems that are easy for us. We pretend that they're easy for uh, computers, and that's something that we need to uh, to to combat and 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 having. Uh, clearer vision in our mind, this is not really uh, the case. So, and there are you know, people that are trying to, uh, to do AGI, so the Terminator or Agent Smith or Commander Data, whatever uh, you would think, but th this is really what most computers can do. So with the, the exception of the uh, latest, uh, deep uh, latest uh, bottom dynamics uh, video, which I'm sure uh, everybody here uh, have seen of uh, robots uh, dancing, uh, this took about uh, uh, three months to choreo uh, choreograph. So uh, the way we build robots today is very far from uh, what we think or what we would like uh, uh, to be. So uh, we'd like it to be. So uh, intelligence is still very, very far. And definitely we're very far from uh, AGI. And, uh, and, and in, in my research, uh, I'm trying to, uh, 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 to do, uh, you know, to try and solve uh, uh, intelligence, so try to get intelligence to work a little bit better. I want just to mention that uh, uh, when you think about RL problems, and there are really three types of uh, problems. Um, there are static problems. So in the example here of the Pac-Man, uh, imagine that Pac-Man has all the, every, everything else is, uh, is, uh, is stable, nothing moves. So the problem is really an, a, a planning problem, just get as many fruits as possible and uh, don't touch the ghost. This is from when I don't care about other agents. They don't exist as far as I'm concerned. In the case of if you think about self-driving car, then this is like I'm driving in the road, but there is no one there. So this is not a very difficult uh, uh, problem every, every, when everybody else is static. And then there are dynamic problems. So this is the case where uh, uh, the ghosts don't see Pac-Man and everything, everything is moving, but still it's not moving very, uh, very, very, very quickly and does not relate uh, to what, uh, what I'm, uh, I'm doing in particular. So dynamic problems are a little bit more difficult uh, because uh, you need to, there are other agents that are moving around but they don't react uh, directly in, in response to what you're doing. But the most interesting uh, aspect of, uh, of learning, uh, learning in the real world is a counterfactual aspect. So uh, and if in the case of Pac-Man, if anyone ever played Pac-Man here, I'm sure most people did, uh, the ghosts do react to Pac-Man. So they sort of know what it's doing and they try to catch it uh, when, uh, uh, when, uh, when they can. And when uh, Pac-Man eats a the fruit, then uh, Pac-Man is trying to eat them. Or in the case of driving, when I'm driving on the road, other cars are going to react to what, uh, to what I do. Uh, so, so basically, uh, the, the, those three types of viral problems are, are, the, are really what, what is interesting. We're pretty good at static problems. Uh, we're not the bad at dynamic problems and we're pretty clueless in counterfactual problems. So the, our way, uh, the way we model interaction between agents, whether they're uh, uh, computer agents or uh, human and, and computer is, not, is just not uh, there yet. We don't have the theory, we don't have uh, uh, the tools uh, uh, to use it. And just, uh, so I've worked in the last uh, three years on uh, on self-driving cars, uh, uh, just to mention that uh, an RL problem is a very complex problem. I don't know what is in my reward. I don't know what I observe. And I also don't, not, it's not even clear uh, what I can do. Uh, the reason that it's not clear what I can do is that ultimately uh, uh, my control is, uh, um, is, uh, what, is uh, the steer what I do with the steering wheel, uh, gas and brake. Uh, this is uh, of course pretty difficult to, uh, uh, to consider because uh, I, humans don't think in terms of I'm going to press the brake for 1.35 seconds and then I'm going to hit, uh, tilt the steering wheel by uh, uh, 30 degrees uh, per, uh, uh, per second uh, for, uh, uh, for 0 0.8 seconds. So pe humans think about actions in a much, more, much higher level. They, they use a, a much more complex uh, abstraction and, and it's not clear that uh, uh, how to even formulate uh, driving a car as an RL problem. 
Um, but that's a different topic for a different, uh, a different talk. Shai, we have a number of questions. Would you like to take them now? Uh, I, I think we should wait because I'm currently I'm just giving an overview and then I want to dive into a one particular uh, topic, which I think is very important. And, uh, and then we can, we can take it, I think, then. Okay. Um, so so what, what, what I'm advocating that we should think about not a, a artificial intelligence, which is perhaps an overly ambitious goal, but rather uh, some, a little bit, something which is a little bit uh, less ambitious, which I call external intelligence. So basically how you design a system that would work with other systems, human uh, or not, uh, where the, the, the RL based uh, system knows that it's going to be interacting with someone else. In the case of a self-driving car, so it's not a completely fully autonomous self-driving car, but rather a system that knows that it operates with a human in the loop and the human is going to tell it what to do, take the steering wheel occasionally uh, and so forth. Um, and there are five principles uh, of uh, extended intelligence and that's how I value uh, research in, in the field. Uh, they're written here. Uh, awareness means that you know how well you're doing. Um, uh, accountability means that you can explain why you did what you did maybe in words, maybe by showing calculation. Adaptivity means that you function uh, not only uh, uh, when, uh, in, in the condition that you were trained for, but in somewhat different conditions. I think those are uh, undebatable. Uh, the most important one though is uh, the next one, which is life cycle consciousness. Basically uh, debugging an RL system is virtually impossible. So uh, uh, trying to understand why an RL system uh, doesn't work is, uh, is, is extremely difficult. And uh, currently, uh, I think this is a main impediment in, uh, in a wide scale application of RL. And then uh, last but not least, we need to be able to scale with resources, more compute, more, more uh, data. Uh, we want to have a, a better policy. So those are the five principles. And this is how I evaluate research in RL according to the, con to the contribution uh, to those uh, five, uh, uh, five principles. What I'm going to do with the rest of this talk um, is I'm going to talk about risk sensitivity and robustness. So I'm going to talk about a particular uh, aspect of, uh, of the broader uh, scheme of things that's going to focus on adaptivity, to some extent accountability and scalability. We're not going to talk about life cycle uh, consciousness, even though it's very important. And, uh, and, and I really focus about, about adaptivity and, and, uh, and uh, uh, scalability. So, want to adapt situations that are, uh, we're, we, we're, we're not uh, trained with. So uh, before I move to the next, uh, to, the, to, to the main part of the talk, now would be a good time to take uh, some questions. Uh, Sanjeev, I, I can't hear you. <clears throat> yeah, so let me read some questions. So Devda Dubashi was asking that Boston Dynamics robots don't use RL or ML for any ML, right? Yes, this is correct. They, they use a uh, model predictive control. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, uh, unless I talk to them within December, they don't use any RL. So he's also asking uh, contrafactual, counterfactual here means multi-agent, is that right? Uh, it's contrafactual meaning uh, means a multi-agent, but uh, uh, not necessarily uh, so, but also um, uh, there might be uh, 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 objects in the environment that are not fully operating agents, but rather they react uh, uh, to you. Uh, so it, they don't have to be uh, um, uh, self, uh, uh, self, uh, um, selfish agents uh, on their own. Okay. All right. All right. So let me let me continue then with uh, um, the main uh, uh, aspect of this talk. So. So why should you be risk sensitive? So this is the example, the pinball example we had before. Uh, there, uh, there is a, a, a blue uh, ball that you control with the objective of, of getting to the red target. And you have uh, two options. You can go through the longer and safer route or through the shorter and more risky route. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, so suppose you want to get to the airport. Um, and the question is, uh, which one should you choose? Uh, which, uh, and, and when you look at the, at the lower route, the more risk, the riskier one on expectation, it looks better, but, but its tail is heavier. So, you know, if your flight is around here, your flight time, you're probably going to take the longer and safer route because it will get you there with high probability. So, so the point of the exercise, it really depends on your objective. So uh, what we're saying here that if you're going to be risk sensitive, uh, as in you're going to try and, uh, and minimize uh, um, not the expected, not the expected time, but rather 
some uh, risk measure, then it's going to lead to robust policies. So uh, what are, uh, when you talk about uncertainty, what are the type of uncertainties that, uh, that we have in mind? So there are three types of uncertainty that we consider. The first one, which we'll address today, is what's known as par parameter uncertainty. So basically, I'm not sure what are the model parameters, maybe because I didn't sample enough, maybe because things are changing, but I want to solve to find the best policy under the worst possible parameters in some uncertainty set of the uh, expected discounted uh, uh, return. The second type of uncertainty is what we call inherent uncertainty, that just because there is randomness uh, uh, in, the, in the process itself, we know the process, but there is some inherent uh, randomness. For example, if I offer uh, to you guys to play the following game with probability half, you win a dollar, it's probably that you lose a dollar. Uh, most of you guys will, will eagerly play it for fun, but then if I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, make the stakes 1,000 or 1 million larger, then I think for most of you, this will become much less, uh, less of a fun game even though in expectations, uh, the two policies are, are the same. So policy two is, is, is of course, uh, uh, if you're risk averse and policy two is, is something you're not going to choose. And if you're risk seeking, then maybe policy two would, would be a good idea. Uh, so uh, uh, the way we model it is uh, we want to find the, 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 the policy that maximizes some uh, uh, risk measure. In this case, you can think about it like, like uh, 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 what's known as uh, uh, Variance uh, adjusted expectation, but there are many other risk measures you, you, you can uh, you can consider. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, um, um, humans tend often to be risk aware, uh, either risk seeking or risk sensitive. But uh, risk is uh, has been shown uh, what time and time again to be a, a, an important factor in uh, in, uh, in in the decisions that humans are, are making. Another is the most interesting uh, type of uncertainty, which we'll just touch upon today. And that's uh, what's known as, as model uncertainty. So in model uncertainty, the model itself is not known. So you're not sure exactly what even the class of the model is. Uh, and you define your policy not in terms of, uh, of uh, um, in, in terms of uh, your policy, basically you want to maximize the return, but under the worst possible model. So it's not just parameters that are, are, are you don't know, the model itself, uh, maybe it's a Markov model, maybe it's a non-Markov model, uh, you, you don't really know. And, uh, and then uh, um, you want to uh, be able to address a model uh, uh, mismatch uh, directly. Okay, so uh, risk sensitivity is important because it's important in many applications where failure is expensive. Uh, and now we all also mentioned that uh, in almost all problems of interest, the model is not really known. Um, and uh, as I said before, uh, we want uh, scalability. Uh, so we want algorithms that would work better with more data. We want adaptivity and we want uh, accountability. So we want to be able to at least to some uh, sense explain why we chose uh, the policy that we did. And a good explanation can be, I chose a particular policy because while this is not the optimal policy for the current model, I was unable to tell whether it's model A or model B and it's good against the worst of, of the two. So that's a reasonable way to uh, uh, produce uh, accountability. Okay, so uh, before uh, 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 we, we go any further, I just want to mention something about computational complexity. Uh, I had a paper with, uh, with John uh, Stiglitz about a few, seven years ago. Uh, basically, uh, in this paper and, and, and quite a few follow-ups, uh, every all of those problems is difficult. So from now on, uh, we don't discuss NP-hardness. All of the problems are difficult. Uh, so we'll forget about trying to find is a solution in very few cases, uh, there is a miracle, but uh, uh, most, most often uh, the problems are very, that we're trying to solve are very large. So let's uh, ignore uh, complexity for the rest of, uh, of the talk today. Okay, so uh, I'll start with talking about uh, a very particular problem it's called robust MDPs, uh, where you're using function approximation. And uh, let me explain what are robust MDPs. So the problem is a planning problem. So everything is known. There is no learning uh, involved or learning. If a, any learning happened, it happened before. And uh, there, the, the, the transitions are uncertain because maybe we have, uh, we sample data and uh, they have confidence intervals around them. Maybe we have a simulator that we're using or maybe the dynamics uh, themselves change with time. So we're not sure what are the transitions. So in a classical MDP, you have a, a say, say state is zero here and, and you have the conditional transition to S1, S2, and S3, that sums up uh, up to one. 
in a in a in a uh, an MDP which has an uncertainty in it in, in a robust MDP, we're not exactly sure what is a conditional transition from S0 to S1, but rather it's there is an interval around it, or uh, we're not exactly sure what's the conditional transition from S0 to S2. Uh, there is a, an interval here uh, around it representing the level of, uh, of uncertainty. Okay, so just to be a little bit more precise, uh, the state actions in the world are the same as the standard model. Uh, the transitions now, uh, all that we know about them, that they belong to some uncertainty set, which is a, a, a convex uh, uncertainty set, uh, um, uh, which we, we have a precise definition of. So, and we're looking for a policy spy that would maximize the worst sketch of objectives. So it's a soup in, soup over policies, in, in over all, um, all parameters. So this is a, a, a param parameter uncertainty of the expected discounted return. And if you wish, you can think about it as a game that there are two players, one player chooses a policy and then nature uh, plays the worst possible model against uh, this policy. So it's a game against nature uh, kind of thing. Okay, so how do you solve such problems? Uh, so for a fixed policy, uh, you can show that this is what you're looking for is uh, uh, you're looking for the policy, for, for a fixed policy pi, uh, your, with your value function or robust value function is a worst case over all possible model of the discounted uh, uh, return. And the way to think about it that uh, I choose pi and then uh, nature is going to uh, maliciously find the worst case model against me. So here it, it, from all the possible transitions, it will choose uh, the conditional transition that is absolutely worse uh, for me. And then maybe I'm going to move to state F3 and then nature again will choose the worst possible transition from, uh, 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 from it, and so forth and so forth. So, so the, the sampling process involves me choosing uh, a state uh, and uh, choosing an action, and then nature choosing the worst possible model against me, and so forth and so forth until uh, the process uh, um, continues. So uh, uh, you can show that for a fixed policy, uh, there, there is a, a nonlinear, uh, but nevertheless, a not too difficult uh, uh, Bellman equation. This is a fixed point equation uh, for so trying to solve for uh, uh, v of pi. So uh, the value uh, the value of pi is equals uh, the return plus uh, discount factors times this uh, infimum over all transition probability of the of the, the policy. So this is uh, the, the robust Bellman equation, and you can even solve it uh, if you if you optimize them over pi. And this was solved about 15 years ago using policy iteration or value iteration uh, for small problems. Uh, for large problems, of course, we cannot enumerate uh, the state space. The state space is too large for us to enumerate. So we need to find another approach uh, to solve it. This is a so-called uh, curse of uh, dimensionality. Okay, so uh, uh, let's, uh, let's take a baby step. So, so what, what do we do when you have a large state space? So uh, the classical thing to do, the simplest one, is to uh, uh, build an approximation. This is known as the approximate value function. So we try to approximate the value function as a, multi uh, a multiple of uh, some feature dependent set. So this is a, a feature dependent vector, predefined, and a vector w which we're trying to optimize. So uh, the idea is that we want to find a w such that uh, v tilde of phi, the approximation is close to the actual uh, true value. So how do we do that for a standard uh, non-robust MDP? Uh, we take the value V pi of S and we, we write it as a, the expectation. We want to approximate it as a, as a, as, as a linear approximation uh, at the function of W. So we're actually going to sample many trajectories. So I'm going to sample say 100 million, maybe a thousand, 10,000, a million uh, trajectories. And then I'm going to sample and regress uh, uh, with respect to W. Because I have, uh, I have a, a estimation from the expectation. I have a phi of s, which is a, a fixed and known. And so all I need to do is to regress for a w. So this looks uh, uh, easy enough. Uh, but then the issue is what do, how, how do I, what can I do uh, for the robust uh, problem? So for a robust problem, even for a fixed uh, policy pi, then I have this uh, infimum here. Uh, but but how, I don't know how to sample trajectories from the worst case model, because in the dynamics that we had before, I choose a main policy, and then the adversary choose the worst possible policy against me. But uh, in this game against nature, the adversary has to solve uh, the game. So uh, I don't know how to uh, uh, sample trajectory 
from the worst case model. That's sort of the, the, the crux of a memory that uh, this uh, worst case model is unknown to the adversary or to me. So, uh, so what's the idea? So the idea is, uh, is really uh, uh, to bootstrap. And uh, recall the Bellman equation, which is written uh, here. So uh, what, are, what are we going to do? We're going to start with initial weights and, uh, and sample uh, n samples uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the states. And then at every iterate, we're going to pretend that our previous estimation is good. And if our previous estimation is good, so if uh, uh, the, value, the value function uh, is, can, be, uh, can be represented as a, as, as a, as a multiplicate of as the as WK uh, time the previous uh, uh, estimate. So it's, uh, this is our, our pre my previous estimate of the value function. Then if I pretend this to be uh, the case, then I can still have uh, solve this infimum now because the infimum involves what I know, but I pretend that my estimate is good, uh, is good enough. So the trick is that I solve for, I start from some W zero and then I solve WK uh, plus one, given that I trust my estimate WK and I do it uh, essentially up until, uh, until convergence. So, so this is a, a, a trick that, uh, the, whose uh, purpose is to circumvent uh, not knowing uh, uh, the model uh, uh, precisely. So this is the algorithm. It's, uh, it's essentially a very simple algorithm. You need to solve uh, a nonlinear, but still uh, not a very difficult robust optimization uh, uh, problem at every, at every stage. And, uh, and the guarantee that you can get is that you get convergence and you get error bounds. The error bounds are in terms of how good your approximation is. Because if your approximation initially, um, this is a, if your approximation is, 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 is not good uh, original, then there is not much you can do. And if it's good, then uh, uh, essentially you're all, you're all set. So if you start, if you have some, you have a good approximation, maybe because the fee is very large or because uh, you have some insight in the problem, you can, you can actually prove error bound and convergence, and then you can make, you can go into a deep architecture, drive a Q-learning algorithm and, uh, and so forth. So essentially, once you, uh, once you uh, uh, let the bootstrap uh, work for you, then uh, it allows you to solve uh, robust uh, uh, problems. Uh, Shai, there are a number of comments and questions. Would you like sure. to take them? Yes, now, now would be a good time, actually. Sure, so there's a question by Zaiwai Chen. How do you carry out the algorithm when the transition probabilities are not known? Um, so so uh, it's a, this is a planning problem. You need to assume that the transition probabilities are known. If, if they're not known, you can do a Q-learning type uh, approach, which uh, uh, is, uh, is going to add another layer of, of complexity. But in principle, this is for a planning problem. Okay. Now, there are a number of comments from your earlier slides. I'll just go through them quickly. Uh, so Shalabet said that there's another formulation of risk sensitive models, those with exponentiated cost structures. So yes. is there a connection of such formulations with this one? Uh, not with this one, but with the, the next one we're going to uh, address, uh, uh, definitely we, we, there is a, a connection there. Dave the Dubashi then said chance, chance constraints are also used to model risk sensitive uh, uh, constraints. I, I didn't hear that. Chance constraints. Yeah. So. We'll discuss that uh, uh, shortly. And I think there's a, so there's one question from Rahul. How do these models account for random delays before current action impacts performance of the system? The short answer is that they don't. Right. Um, this, is a, this is a very important topic uh, of, the, of delay, uh, delay uh, uh, feedback, uh, uh, but uh, they're, they're, it's not addressed by it. Very important and very uh, actually current uh, research topic. Okay, Alka Yadav is asking that, can we use other algorithm too in place of bootstrap? So I don't think so. I think that uh, at least for this particular problem, so I, 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 I was unable to come up with any other algorithm. Uh, if, if, there is, uh, if there is another algorithm, I'd be you know, excited to hear about. Okay. Uh, Shala Bhatnagar is saying output of the algorithm would lie outside the subspace, wouldn't it? Yes, it would, and and then there is also a projection st stage step, which I, I ignored for the sake of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, brevity. But but yes, you, of course, Charles is right. Devdutt is saying, how do you get good representations for a state from deep networks? 
uh, that's uh, the million dollar question. Uh, this work assumes that uh, representation, good representation are given. Uh, I think it's a topic of a whole uh, new, uh, new, I would say, research and endeavor on finding uh, good representations. Okay, a so couple of more questions. Uh, so Shashwat Misha is saying, isn't the algorithm sensitive to the initial point? Uh, it's sensitive only in terms of convergence rates. If uh, you can show, in fact, that if you start uh, in a good place, then you get there faster, uh, get faster to convergence, but, but it's only sensitive in the, in the sense of, of rates. Okay. All right, so last question from Ikra Atlaf. Uh, does sampling method affect end result? Yes, so the sampling method that, that affect uh, the end result. And in fact, you can show that you can speed up uh, convergence by, 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 a, by a large margin if you sample things in, uh, in the interesting uh, regions. Uh, that's again, that, uh, I mean, the topic of how to sample uh, for planning is, is, uh, is, is quite interesting and also a very, a very current uh, uh, research topic. One more question now. This is convergence of a nonlinear optimization problem, right? Right. The local or global optimization? So you, you convert to a, to a low, in, this, in, the case, in the particular case of a linear function approximation, not in the deep case, you convert to actually a global uh, mm -hmm. optimum, but it's not, the, it's not necessarily the global optimum that you want because you, you may not be able to represent the, the value function because you're doing approximations. So you, convert, you, you are getting converted to something that is uh, global. The, the convert is not local in the sense it's not a gradient-based algorithm. However, uh, uh, you are converted to a place which is a, which, which is a, a, um, um, a global optimum. Okay, so, so uh, let me just show you a, a, a result which is uh, curious and interesting. And in fact, I don't know how to explain it. So, so here is an, uh, the, the American put option we had before. Uh, basically, the, qu the, the question is when to execute and you need to do that to, to evaluate uh, the option. Remember that when the price is more than K, I can make money. When the price is below K, it's worth zero. So I want to know when to, uh, when to estimate, when to execute. And you can formulate as an MDP. There are many formulations uh, uh, and you can uh, estimate the price transition from local data. And, uh, uh, and of course, because the, 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 the models or the, the stock market today or you know, two days ago, it may, may be the same, but maybe uh, three years ago, it was completely different. So the stock market changes and everything changes. So we don't really believe that we have enough data. Okay. So let me show you an experiment uh, uh, that was done. It was done uh, with uh, uh, everything is in simulation. So uh, no real data was used. So we know exactly uh, what happened. So the true model is, is a mean reverting, uh, uh, mean reverting uh, uh, transition that depend on price. So there is a particular trend and, and the sort of the, 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 the price of the stock wants to go back to this uh, trend. So this is, uh, there are many such models. Uh, uh, so this is a, a particular mean reverting uh, uh, model. But to estimate the mode itself, we used uh, a constant transition mode. So we used a much simpler uh, model, uh, not, not mean reverting, but rather a simple uh, constant transition. So here we, we're looking at, uh, at, a, at the, the, the model class that we're trying to use is different. It's just not, we're not solving the, the right model class. We're solving, we're trying to solve for a simpler, overly simplistic uh, uh, model class. And what we see here, this is that, uh, um, this is A, and, and we see the probability that the return is more than A. So this is, remember that uh, because uh, uh, whenever we go below uh, the, the ex execution price, we cut the process, then we're all going to, always going to make more, uh, at least zero. So, and this is the probability of making more than a, uh, a dollars per, uh, per trade. So, uh, and what we see here, this is a nominal policy in, in blue. So this is uh, basically, Estimate from data. Use your estimation and see what uh, uh, what gives in uh, in, uh, in 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 testing. And in, in uh, red, we see the robust uh, approach. So the robust approach dominates uh, the nominal approach. And it it and and remember that this is it makes it doesn't make a lot of money, but it, it makes uh, money more consistently. Uh, so what we see here in this experiment, and there are other experiments like that. So that when you choose a robust policy, you get robustness not just for not having the right uh, transition distribution, but also to not having the right, per, the right model class. And that's a very interesting property that, um, uh, well, I have an intuitive explanation, 
I don't have a theoretical guarantee here. And uh, if anyone wants to uh, have a, an idea how to do it, I'll be happy to, if they uh, you know, shoot me an email uh, to, uh, because this is, uh, I think, a very interesting, uh, a very weird phenomenon, actually. OK, so uh, uh, let's uh, move to the second part of uh, today's uh, talk. I'm going to talk about uh, a risk sensitive uh, uh, um, um, po uh, policy gradients, and especially about conditional value at risk. Um, so uh, let's just re remind ourselves what the definition of, uh, of, the, of the CVAR. Uh, so if you have a random variable x and uh, alpha is a quantile, then the, the, the alpha uh, CVAR is a condition expectation, given that you are in the low, of the, in the low uh, uh, alpha quantile. So, so condition that if say alpha is 5%, then condition that you're in the 5% worse uh, event, then this is how much you, 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 uh, you, you, you believe you're going to get. Also known as ex expected shor shortfall by our uh, economist uh, friends. And this is of course, uh, uh, it, it, uh, 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 this risk uh, criterion is, is amplifies uh, rare disastrous uh, events. So estimation is trivial, right? Because to estimate, uh, uh, the, the, to estimate the, the, the mean, you just take the empirical mean. To estimate the CVAR, you just take the alpha and worst samples and average them. So estimation is trivial, as long as alpha is not really small. So if it's you know, not, not uh, something that is order of magnitude of, of your data, as long as it's not really small, uh, uh, estimation should not, uh, there is no, no real problem. So think about alpha for the duration of the stock as, as 5%. So it's not really uh, you know, one, to the, one, one to the power of uh, minus six, uh, 10 to the power of minus six, it's a, it's a reasonable number. Okay, so uh, uh, what people often do in RL is that they encode the policy by uh, parameters, for, for example, uh, deep network parameters, and then those parameters are going to affect, the, uh, define the control policy. The control policy defines the stochastic, uh, affect the stochastic systems and uh, uh, the payoff uh, function. So in the standard objective, you want to maximize over your policy, those are the parameters of the policy, of the expected uh, return. And in the risk objective, you just replace the expectation with uh, some risk measure, for example, the conditional value at risk. So the, the framework is exactly the same, or maybe something which is a little bit more interesting, like you want to maximize the expectation, but you want your conditional value at risk to be uh, more than something or different combinations of, of that. So what happened uh, uh, in the previous work where people, uh, people mostly for finance uh, looked at the situation where they only affect the payoff function and they do not affect the system itself. So the stochastic system itself, because you know, the current common belief is that if there is a market and you only affect your own portfolio, you're, such a, uh, you're a small fish and you don't affect uh, uh, everything that is happening uh, to the system itself. But uh, we being uh, engineers, uh, we are also going to affect the stochastic system. So we think about the conditional value at risk or other risk measures are, are, are measures that affect uh, everything, uh, everything around us. Okay, so what we do, uh, basically we, we're going to show how to estimate the gradient of the conditional value at risk. The grant here is with respect to the policy parameters and how to, do, uh, how to use a sampling based uh, estimator to solve uh, uh, the problem and then the update of the policy itself, that's sort of standard uh, um, stochastic gradient uh, uh, descent type of, uh, type of approach. So let's talk about gradient estimation. So this is a, a known as a likelihood ratio method um, reinvented in, uh, in uh, uh, the RL circles as a policy gradient. The idea is, 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 is really simple. Uh, you want to estimate the expectation of a random variable X uh, we just rewrite it uh, uh, and then uh, uh, do some manipulations. Uh, this equals the uh, expectation of the grant of, uh, of fx over fx uh, times, uh, times x. And this can be approximated as, uh, as taking the, the sum of uh, the gradient of the log of the likelihood of, uh, of each uh, xi is times xi. So this is really elementary uh, manipulations under some, uh, there are some, uh, um, user uh, um, buyers uh, uh, buyers remorse here that you need to be a little bit careful, but all, all in all, uh, this is a, a simple algebra. And, and what you get is that you can estimate the gradient 
uh, fairly efficiently as, as, uh, as the sum of the log of uh, the likelihood of your sample. Okay. So, what, uh, so this is for expectation. So maybe if you want to do the same for a CVAR, maybe we can take uh, uh, the granite to look at the alpha and worse samples and then just sum, sum those guys up. Uh, so exactly the same expression that we had uh, uh, before. But this does not work. And the reason that it does not work is because of Leibniz integral law. Uh, this is, I remind you, calculus one or two or one. And just to remind you what it means, if you want to integrate uh, from minus infinity uh, to, the, to Q, uh, and once you start do the differentiation, you, you need to take into account the fact that the Q itself is going to change. So Leibniz integral uh, law uh, tells us that we also need to uh, uh, take into, a uh, into, into effect the change in the quantile itself once we change the parameters according to which we derive. And, and this is basically written here. So you need to, uh, when you integrate with us from, uh, uh, when you look at the grant of the integral, you need to take here this minus infinity to Q and then you need to uh, uh, have uh, the gradient of uh, Q times uh, the likelihood of it. So this is, there is a correction term you need to take uh, into account that comes essentially from uh, a, a very classical, a very classical result. So uh, what we, what is the result then? Once you, once you factor everything, then you get that the gradient of the of the quant of the CVAR is the uh, uh, expectation of the log likelihood ratio, uh, but here you need to deduct the Q, the, the actual quantile of uh, uh, as of of the of the parameters that you have. So um, the, the understanding is here that everything he, everything that we see here has an additional subscript of theta. So the, the parameter that we're trying to uh, that we derive with respect to appear in every term here, every term. But of course, we don't know the quantile because it's hard to compute. So instead we can take the empirical quantile. And now our, our formula is, is, is you know, quite simple. Take the alpha and worse samples, but replace uh, uh, Q with uh, uh, the empirical Q. And this is going to introduce a bias. So this is going to mean that our estimation of the bias is going to be, um, uh, it's going to be, uh, our, our, our estimation of the quantile is going to be biased and therefore of the gradient. Uh, but still the algorithm is uh, as following. So you draw uh, N IID samples, you estimate the empirical quantile, uh, sort them, select the uh, worst elements and estimate uh, the CVAR. So the algorithm, it's essentially the same algorithm that we know for estimating the mean with a, a few small modifications. So we just need to, uh, uh, to modify it uh, accordingly. And then uh, if you do that, uh, then uh, uh, basically everything falls uh, fall through. You get a grant algorithm. Uh, but I want to show an example to give you uh, an intuition of what is going on. So this is a Tetris, uh, Tetris example that we had, uh, that we had before. And uh, uh, we comp comp compare two, uh, two algorithms. We compare uh, um, uh, the CVAR optimization for, I don't remember which, what alpha is, probably 5% or, or something like that, and uh, the standard, uh, uh, standard algorithm. And here we see the histogram. So the standard policy gradient has an average reward of, uh, in, it is in red, it has, a, it has an average reward of uh, uh, 451 as opposed to uh, for, uh, 414 for, for the CVAR optimization. So you see that it's, on average, it's better. Uh, but, but you also see, for, just from observing that you get a lot of concentration of the CVAR optimization around uh, from say 400 to 450. So, so obviously when you optimize for the average reward, you get better results on the average reward. But let's see what happens uh, um, when you look even at the quant quantiles. So the quantile of the, um, of the CVAR is lower than the quantile of the average reward. Now at this point you should be concerned because uh, you, I told you that I'm optimizing the conditional uh, value at risk, but the, 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 the quantile itself uh, is not the same as the, the conditional value at risk. And let's see the picture. So here I zoomed over the really low scores. So this is a score that are, are really low. And we see that uh, in red, the histogram of the standard policy grant as opposed to blue, the CVAR optimization. And, and indeed, what we can see that uh, the, what what CVAR is buying you, it's buying you resilience in the very low values. 
So, uh, so basically, if this is the point where you, you would be embarrassed that uh, you didn't manage to, uh, uh, to play Tetris even remotely well, this is not going to happen when you do CVAR optimization. When you do mean optimization, it may happen uh, to you. So, so my claim is that when you do CVAR optimization, you can get uh, uh, um, results which are uh, really good uh, for, uh, across the board. However, on average, there is no reason to believe you're going to get a, a good result. So, um, Shai, one question was there. Um, uh, so Dave, that was wondering, you know, you're using this likelihood ratio method and it's known to be have high variance. So is that something you see and do you consider alternate methods? Yeah, so, so this is true. Uh, uh, policy gradient methods are known to have uh, uh, in practice uh, high, uh, high variance. For this particular problem, uh, the variance is small because this is a fairly small, easily explainable uh, problems. Uh, I think in the last uh, three years, there have been uh, quite a bit of, uh, of progress in, in making those problems uh, less and less uh, noisy. And I think the algorithms are pretty good. So in fact, you can, you can combine uh, uh, CVAR with uh, things like SAC, uh, soft autocritic, or uh, things like the TRPO, um, uh, proximal optimization of, of different, uh, different types. So, so uh, while true, uh, I think at this point, uh, this is not such a big uh, concern because uh, we know how to reduce variance, plus we have uh, pretty big uh, computers. Okay. I think I just want to a clarification. So she says, could you ex please explain the average reward here again? What does it mean? Yeah, so there is a reward function, which is, uh, I don't go on, I'm not going to get into it, but basically every brick that you don't fail, you get a point and whenever you clear a, a line in the Tetris, then you get a, uh, some bonus. So the average reward means that you look at all trajectories and for all trajectories are the same. So every, you can't, let's suppose you have, you're going to do, a, uh, to run a million trajectories. You're going to take the million numbers. You're going to sum them up and this is going to be, uh, or take the average and this is going to be average reward. The CVAR on the other hand, you take the million trajectories. You, you look at the score that you got per trajectory. Let's say 5%, you take the million trajectory, take the lowest 5% and you just average uh, them. It represents an attitude uh, to risk, if you, if you wish, and especially when the numbers are not very low, uh, this represents a, an event which is likely to happen uh, as opposed to uh, something that is unlikely to happen and you just want to protect uh, against. By the way, how am I, how, how am I doing in on time? Um, I mean, I guess we are kind of nearing the, uh, the end, so, but you can go for another five minutes. That's okay, so, so uh, I'm going to... Um, uh, I, I, I'm going to skip, about, uh, skip other risk measures. They also work. And I want to uh, give you a taste of uh, a result that, uh, that we have. So initially I said, you know, risk awareness uh, and uh, robust policies is kind of the same and I waved my hands. And at this point you say, well, you know, this guy is waving his hands, why should we care? Uh, but there is a result that we can prove, which is a, a special case of a much more general result. And that's a, that's a point. So, so what we're going to show now, or argue at least, is that uh, when you solve sort of conditional value at risk, it's exactly the same at the particular robust optimization uh, problem. So CVAR, uh, 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 CVAR opt uh, optimality and, uh, and robust optimality are exactly the same. And let me be here a little bit more precise. So you can look at uh, what we call multi multiplicative perturbation. So this is... Um, the case when uh, I have a nominal value P and I look at all the transitions where uh, uh, the nominal value is multiplied by some delta and there is a budget for all the delta. So delta, um, delta one times delta two, all that, uh, the product is less than some uh, eta. So basically this uh, uh, entangles uh, the transitions from different states. So the transitions are at uh, say state, uh, for the condition transition from S0 and A0 to S1 are entangled with other, other states in some, in some way. So everything is entangled. It basically means you cannot get hurt all the time. So it's, uh, um, um, it's, uh, it just, uh, it's a way to, to create an uncertainty set, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, a bit more complicated than uh, just a multiplication of uncertainty sets. And uh, the theorem that is, uh, I want to uh, present is that uh, the, if you want to solve the conditional value at risk at, um, at, uh, at one over eta, so think about eta as the, the budget that you have, uh, equals uh, the worst possible uh, 
worst, worst possible re reward uh, of, uh, of delta eta, and delta eta is exactly the same. So if you want to solve, a, if you're going to solve this particular robust optimization problem, where not everything can, be, can happen at the same time, so uh, things are, are in, in, entangled, that's exactly the same as solving the, the CVAR uh, problem. And that's a special case of a much more general result that states that essentially whenever you have a risk uh, measure of a particular type, the definition are less important, but for those of you who are in the know, that has to be a convex coherent uh, risk measure, there is an equivalent robust optimization problem. And in fact, the reverse is true too. So whenever there is a robust optimization problem of a particular type of uncertainty set, uh, which are um, other product set or sets that have this uh, can be created in a way which is uh, multiplicative and additive. So it creates something like that. So they can be entangled, but not in a way which is uh, too complicated. There, then, then there is an equivalent risk, uh, risk measure that you can optimize. So when you ask me, what should I do? Should I solve a robust MDP or should I solve a risk, uh, risk aware, uh, uh, risk, uh, risk, uh, risk aware measure? It's whatever you, it's more convenient for you because you're doing the same. Um, so I think that uh, this is really the message that I wanted uh, to, uh, to bring. Um, if time allows, I, I want to just touch upon two issues which I think are really important and those are uh, recent to our works. And that the first one is how to construct an uncertainty set. And the second one is how to adapt online. So let, let me start with, a, the, with, a, with the first one. And uh, I'll propose a model. This is a very simple probabilistic model. Whenever I'm going to choose a policy, uh, pi, so I, I sometimes do fail to do that. So with a small probability alpha, somebody else is choosing a pi for me and let's call it uh, pi, uh, pi prime. So uh, this leads to the following uh, architecture, which we call the action robust. In this case, it's uh, GDPG. It's, uh, um, it's policy granite based, but that's less important. And the idea is the following. Um, there is a, you look for the, an optimal actor policy, and then there is an adversary, this is, ties back to robust optimization, that is going to do the worst possible thing against you on a greedy level. And then you evaluate the joint policies. The policy with high probability, of probability one minus alpha, succeeds to choose what it wants, but with probability uh, alpha, which is small, uh, is, uh, the adversary modifies it. And now you have a loop of training. So you, tra you train the, the actor, uh, you train the adversary, and then you train the critic, and you, you, you work in, in a loop. And this uh, idea is really, uh, how do I construct the uncertainty set? Because one of the, of the major difficulties, difficulties in robust optimization is that you need the uncertainty set to come from somewhere. Uh, but it's not really where. Maybe there is a very natural physical explanation, but maybe there is not. And what we show, and uh, uh, this is something that I, I, I just want to, to touch upon, is that uh, this is a graph of performance. This is uh, some robotic domain. It's less important, but we see that uh, yellow is high uh, and, um, and red is, uh, deep red is, uh, is bad. And we look here at noise probability and relative mass. So think about this as a robot and we change the relative mass uh, with respect to what it was supposed to be. So we have to adapt. And now what we see is that if you're going to, uh, uh, to uh, allow the, uh, this, uh, this model, uh, this uh, uh, model, you're going to get a better generalization even if your problem has no noise in it. So basically you're going to get a, a, a better result even if you don't have uh, any noise. And this is what we see here that uh, this is a, a matrix of performance, noise probability versus relative mass. Uh, the point one zero is the original value. So this is the original problem. And what we can see here is that you can get superior performance even in the original problem, not to mention when uh, there is some additional, additional noise uh, added. So I don't think I have time to go into, uh, into the construction and certainty set. It's a very interesting and very important topic. Uh, very much worth uh, uh, diving into, but I don't have the, uh, the time for that. So uh, I'll just uh, I'll conclude by, uh, by saying that um, uh, for me, reinforcement learning has changed from mostly algorithms to uh, data, understanding the representation, and then uh, taking care of the, of the five, uh, uh, five uh, principles 
uh, of exam intelligence. And, and just to mention that uh, as someone who works on theory and practice, uh, full autonomy is very far away. So we are very far from uh, robots you can send and hope that uh, they'll do something, uh, uh, something useful. And uh, RL works best when you have high throughput result, uh, control and a very stochastic environment or a very good simulator, uh, but real world is neither. So there is still a lot, uh, a lot of uh, work to be done. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, that was uh, very nice. We, I guess we have to start the other talk in a couple of minutes. There were some comments uh, about connecting your, uh, you know, latter part of the discussion to GANs. Is that something you want to spell? Uh, to yes. Spell? So, so basically, it is GANs um, to the point where uh, you can show that the, the two concepts are, are equivalent. Uh, I think for GANs, uh, many of us feel that GANs are sort of black magic uh, kind of thing. This is not black magic. Here, you basically construct an uncertainty set on adversary, and this gives you, a, uh, gives you an explanation why GANs work in this particular case. Okay, so thank you so much. I, uh, this was very nice. Uh, thank think, you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, what we can do is maybe take a couple of minutes break and then start exactly at, uh, okay, let's take a one minute break and then start exactly after one minute and we'll have Naveen Goyal speaking then. So we'll just stop for a minute. So I'll just signal my applause for Shai. I don't know if other people can do that right now, but uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Piyush, uh, would you go ahead and introduce uh, Naveen? Uh, We'll just start in 30 seconds. Uh, I'll go next door to Piyush's room. Uh, Piyush, you're still mute. So, so, so I'm just checking with Nami. Uh, okay. I don't see his video yet. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I think that's it. So yes, yeah, so our, our next speaker is uh, uh, is uh, Naveen Goel from Microsoft Research India. He uh, he has he works on several aspects of uh, computer science, uh, you know, geometric algorithms, uh, 
uh, pseudo randomness. Recently, I've seen he's also been working on on neural networks, learning hierarchical languages. And today he's going to tell us about something different, which is uh, about um, learning probability distributions in an unsupervised setting. So with that, over to. Naveen, you are muted. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Piyush. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, can you can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, I can see the screen, but it's not a full screen yet. Yeah, yeah, just a moment. Oops. Um, sorry. Okay. So, um, so this talk is about uh, normalizing flows, and this topic lies at the intersection of uh, applied probability and uh, uh, deep learning on neural networks. And uh, this being uh, an applied probability meeting, I thought I will not make any uh, assumptions about the background uh, on uh, neural networks. So I'll spend some time introducing neural networks and some of the relevant things, but this also means that I'll not be able to go into the proofs. So I'll mainly be defining uh, things and stating theorems and giving general background. Uh, but I hope that's, uh, that's a reasonable trade-off. And please feel free to ask me any questions at any time. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> normalizing flows, what, what are they? They are a recent neural generative model for learning probability distributions. I'm going to define all these terms, but first let's see what's the problem of learning probability distributions that these models solve. Okay. Um, so the problem of learning probability distributions is uh, we are given some unknown um, random variable X in uh, D-dimensional space. Uh, with, and we assume that it's a nice random variable. So it has a probability density function, which does not uh, fluctuate too far and so on. Right, so it does not do anything pathological. And we have uh, independent uh, identical uh, samples of X. And from these samples, we want to learn an approximation to the density of X, okay? And if you can do that, then you'd like to be able to do the following. You'd like to generate new IID samples of X, possibly with some conditioning on some events also, but for, for the moment, we can just say uh, generate samples of X also estimate the density, uh, uh, the density function P sub X of uh, the random variable X at any given point. Okay. So in applications, often the dimension D of the space is very large, but in this talk, I'll mostly focus on D equal to one case. Uh, so this is for two reasons. One is for simplicity. Uh, in, in normalizing flows, the D equal to one case is really special and D greater than one is considerably more complicated. Um, but also there are theoretical reasons for that, which I'll mention later on. Okay. So the problem of learning probability distributions is a classical problem in statistics, it goes back to Gauss who tried to fit uh, Gaussian distribution to data and Pearson tried to fit mixtures of Gaussian, Gaussians to the data. And many other classes of distributions are used, uh, exponential families, graphical models, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and there are many general methods for doing it, uh, method of moments, uh, method of maximum likelihood, and so on. Uh, but the new neural methods seem to do better in modern applications. So let me uh, uh, just briefly mention what these modern applications are. So the, the, many of these applications involve perceptual data, something that we can uh, uh, recognize from, with our senses. So images, video, audio, so on. But also non-perceptual data like molecules, graphs, DNA, sequences, uh, text. So let me give a few examples of images. I won't give examples of the other types of data set. So here is the well-known MNIST data set here each uh, digit image is a sample. And uh, this each image is a vector in 784 dimensional space. Okay, so it's pretty high dimensional. Here's another uh, data set called Fashion Amnist. Again, it's each image is a data point in 784 dimensional space. Here's a 
celebrity photos data set. Here, each image is uh, in space of dimension 256 times 256, or possibly even higher. So these are very high dimensional spaces. What do we understand about these uh, data distributions? Uh, so they do, as we saw, they live in very high dimensional space, but uh, the problem of learning probability distributions without further assumptions is uh, clearly hard. One can easily prove that this cannot be done. One needs exponentially many samples and exponentially the dimension and so on. So one needs some assumption, but here we don't really know what these distributions are and we don't have a good characterization, uh, but there are some informal uh, uh, things we can say. For example, people believe that intrinsically the data behaves like a low dimensional manifold. It, it's close to a low dimensional manifold or it, it has low complexity in some other sense. Although these, none of these is a formal statement. And this is what uh, presumably allows us to learn these distributions. Uh, Non-neural methods don't so, work so well on these distributions. Uh, how well do neural uh, methods work? Uh, so let's see that. But before that, let me very quickly enumerate the main types of neural generative models. So there are variational error encoders, generative adversarial networks or GANs, which, which were discussed in the previous talk briefly. Uh, these, are, the, these are very famous. They generate very good quality samples, but they don't provide density estimation. So that was one of the two things you wanted to do. One was to generate samples, the other was estimate density. They only do genera uh, generational samples. And the third is the normalizing flows model, uh, which is the focus of this talk. So each of these is a class of models and uh, there are uh, lots of models within each class, tens or even hundreds. But uh, I'll just focus on normalizing flows for this talk. So let me just show what normalizing flows can do with uh, two examples. So on the left here is um, the output of um, um, normalizing flow model that was trained on um, Celeb A data set that I showed earlier. And these here are the outputs, uh, output samples from this data set. So these are not real people, these are generated by the model. And on the right here, um, each image on the top row uh, depicts a, a random variable in 2D, uh, the density of that random variable. So if a point is brighter, that means the density is higher. And if it, the point is dark, then the density is low. And the, on the bottom row, uh, what we see is the output, the density that the model learned. So this seems to pretty faithfully reflect the, the input density. Okay, so this seems very good, but how well do these models really work? So to visual inspection, it seems like they do very well. Um, however, rigorous evol evaluation of this is very hard because how can we evaluate these things? One, Perhaps the simplest way would be to compute the a probability distance between the learned distribution and the data distribution, right? But this is hard uh, given the high dimension, uh, but maybe since we believe that these are uh, low probability distributions, one can do that, but th th this remains a work in progress. Uh, other axes along which uh, these models are evaluated are training data set size, how much how many samples we need and how much computation is required for training. Uh, neural models tend to do, uh, uh, to require a lot for both of them. Okay. So, um, so as was said in the previous talk, uh, GANs are black magic, uh, neural uh, normalizing flows are also black magic and we want to uh, 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 take the magic out of these things. So we would like to theoretically analyze these models. So generative models fall under uh, unsupervised learning, uh, but before, which is harder, and there's something called supervised learning, which is presumably easier. Certainly it's much better studied and relatively much better understood. So I'm going to talk about supervised learning a little bit, uh, and also neural networks, how neural networks are solved, uh, are used to solve uh, to uh, how they are applied to supervised learning. Okay, so um, yeah, let me briefly pause here and say where we are. Um, 
so I this uh, introduced the problem of learning probability distributions and uh, I briefly touched upon neural generated models. I'm going to uh, give a very quick introduction to supervised learning problem neural networks, then I'll give a brief sketch of what we understand about this, the, about neural networks uh, for supervised learning. Then I'll get to define normalizing flows based on what we cover. And uh, I'll state our theoretical results for normalizing flows. Okay, um, so here's the supervised learning problem. So there are two, two ingredients uh, with uh, um, a function capital F from d-dimensional space to reals, uh, which is unknown. And again, we assume it that's reasonable, meaning it's uh, not very, um, it has derivatives when needed and uh, it's, it varies reasonably uh, smoothly. And D is an unknown probability distribution, data distribution on the d-dimensional space. So here in cyan, I'm depicting uh, for d equal to one, in the d equal to one case, uh, so the cyan curve is uh, the function f. Now we are given labeled data points. So we sample x, xi is x1 to xn from the distribution d. And for each xi, we provide xi and f of xi, xi which is the label of uh, that point. So this this is this is the main difference from unsupervised learning where we don't get any labels. Here we get labels, and uh, so here in this picture, I by blue points I've depicted uh, these uh, label points which lie on F. And our task is to construct an approximate representation H of uh, capital F from this data. So how can we measure how good uh, is a representation uh, reconstruction H of F? The two, two measures that I use, one is test loss, which is the expectation of h of x uh, minus f of x squared. But this we cannot compute because we don't have access to d. The other is training loss, which is uh, basically the same thing, but it's empirical version of that. So it's sum of h of x i minus f of, f of x i squared over the sample points. So uh, ideally, we would like h to be equal to f, but uh, we may not have sufficient information to achieve that. We can only hope to do that where D puts sufficient uh, amount of data points, right? So, which is okay. So, uh, which is also uh, our test loss will be small as long as uh, H is a good approximation of F on that D has some, some probability. Okay, so, so then the question is how to construct H with small training and test loss. That, that's the supervised learning problem. So um, a purported solution uh, involves two main elements. One is we have to, um, we need to give a class of functions from which our function H will be drawn. So people use, uh, there's a very large set of classes that are used, uh, some of which are listed here, linear functions, polynomials, decision trees, and so on. Neural networks are one of those. So we'll be working with neural networks. So our functions, uh, candidate functions H, which we use to try to approximate F will come from neural networks. Uh, the second element we need is training. So given this class functions, how do we choose the one that's a good approximation of F? So that's the method to fit to the data. So we, we, I need to specify these two things to say how neural networks are used to train, uh, to, to solve supervised learning. So here, first I'll say how neural networks, uh, what, what a neural network is. I'll only describe the, uh, the very simplest types of neural networks. So these are one hidden layer networks uh, with a scalar output, right? So the input is uh, a d-dimensional vector x uh, and the output is n of x, uh, which is given by this formula. Let me explain this. So the neural network has a number of parameters. One is M, which is the number of neurons, number of semands here. And each semand is of this type. Uh, AI, which is a scalar times uh, sigma of WI transpose X plus VI. Each WI is a vector and each VI is a scalar, right? So it's a simple formula. Uh, so you, you take a dot product of X with a weight vector WI and some with bi apply a function sigma, which is called a, an activation function. And I'll explain this a little more in the next slide. 
and sum these things up with uh, uh, with AIs. Okay, so the, that's all a neural network does, uh, one hidden layer neural network. These are also confusingly called two layer networks, but two layers, no, not two hidden layers. Okay. So we can represent these functions more completely, compactly in this way. So A is a vector now, M dimensional vector, so A transpose uh, times sigma applied point wise uh, of W X plus B, W is the matrix of um, uh, uh, which has uh, WIs as the rows. And this construction can be repeated. So output of the first layer can be fed into a next layer and so on. So that, that can be used to define higher depth networks, which I'll not, I'll not try to define very carefully. Okay, so, so N of X here defines a function given if you choose any sets of W1 to WM, A1 to AM and B1 to BM, then that gives us a function. So each choice of these weights defines a function and that gives us the class functions from which we will choose uh, our uh, edge. Okay, uh, here let me quickly say what the activation functions are. So traditionally people used uh, activations like sigmoid or 10H. Um, I've drawn 10H here. Currently most popular is ReLU, which is even simpler. It's just the maximum of ReLU of T is just max of T and zero, okay. Many other functions uh, have been proposed, which also work better than ReLU sometimes, but there's nothing that works the best. Right? But ReLU is by and large the default. And these are nonlinear functions and in fact non-polynomial, and we'll see why uh, in the next few slides. Okay, um, any questions? All right, so let me now say how we use- this one, this one question. So yes, uh, so now this is from al it says, small data sets give good accuracy in training sets. Um, so one can get good accuracy, but will it be helpful for test data? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat this? Uh, yes, it's in the chat. So the small data sets give good accuracy in training sets. Um, one can get good accuracy there, but will that be useful? Helpful? Yeah, that's a, that's a problem. For, for neural models, no. It depends on the model, it depends on the problem, but uh, for neural models, small data sets are not good enough. They are really data hungry. Yes. Okay. Um, so I described the, the class of functions from which we will draw uh, our candidate functions, and now I'll describe how to use, how to fit neural networks to data. Uh, but first, we, we need to answer this question. Uh, can we, is the problem solvable in principle? Can, can neural network approximate the given function f, right? So the answer to that is yes. Um, so this is the, the well-known universality theorem from the 80s and 90s. So it says that any continuous function f uh, from a bounded domain, here we take zero one to the d, but you can take any bounded domain to reals can be well approximated by one hidden layer neural network with sufficiently large bits, so sufficiently many neurons. So M is sufficiently large, right? Or more formally for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a neural network. So which means that there exist weights for it, the W, A, and B, and M. So that uh, N is within epsilon of F for all X's in the domain, okay? As long as the activation function is not polynomial because polynomial, if the activation function was a polynomial, then the output is also a polynomial. And there, we know that there are functions that are not polynomial. So that's why we need it to be non-polynomial. Okay, so, so at least we know that uh, the neural networks are capable of representing functions that we want them to represent. Uh, but this theorem does not tell us two important things. How large does the width need to be in a, for a given situation? and uh, how to find the weights and biases in such networks. Right? So that, that's the training part and that's what I'll describe next. Um, so since we don't have test loss, we can try to choose weights and biases to minimize the training loss, right? Which, which is basically N of X I should be close to F of X I. And this can be done in multiple ways. For example, you could use nonlinear programming or sometimes even linear programming depending on what your activation function is and so on. Uh, but those things only minimize the training loss and don't give a small test loss. Instead, if we use the following uh, gradient-based method, which is very simple, 
but often we also get small test loss, right? So I'll just say, um, uh, give a one one setting that often works. So initialize, we initialize the random, the network randomly. Uh, this is uh, initialization that's often used. So each vector, uh, the weight vector is uh, some, it's chosen from Gaussian distribution according to some, um, uh, using some variance, specific variance. And we just do uh, gradient descent on the loss function. Uh, so this is the loss function, uh, the test loss. And we just do gradient descent on that. And so I just uh, wrote W here, but this is a function of W and B and we do the same thing for A and B. Okay. And then two surprising things happen. The gradient based uh, training works. It gives you small training loss and also gives you small test loss. So why are these things surprising? Uh, let me say that. Um, so uh, the training loss is in general a non-convex function of the weight. So the loss that I wrote down previously for a neural network, that's not a convex function that the situation looks like this for training loss. Uh, and what we want is, uh, uh, is a global, so, but the gradient descent method or gradient based methods only work for, for convex functions. For non-convex functions, there are no guarantees. Uh, it can potentially get stuck in, uh, in local minima for non-convex functions. Uh, and what we want are global minima. But in practice, uh, the previous method still seems to do very well. So th that's why it's surprising. Uh, here is just a, a picture of uh, a visualization of a real uh, neural network. And you can see that it's highly non-convex, which is but what we would have liked is something like this. Okay, so, so that's one mystery. Uh, the other mystery is um, that we minimize the training loss, uh, although our, our real objective was the test loss. But it often happens that even test loss is small for what we get, right? So the cyan function, in cyan is the function that we really want. In purple is the function that we might get, we actually get from training. And there is a function that has small training loss, but large, uh, large test loss. But we don't get the red function, we often get the function purple. So that's the other mystery. So how do we explain this, right? Uh, why do we get good generalization performance? Why do we get good, small test loss? So there's an informal conjecture here, which is that these algorithms are biased towards simple functions, meaning uh, the neural net first uh, fits simpler functions and then tries to adapt more and more to the data, but starts with simpler functions. So it tends to, it won't find the right function in the previous picture. It will first find something simpler that fits the data. Uh, so what is simple is not quite well understood. Uh, that's one problem with this. Uh, the other is uh, it's not quantitative at this point. Um, but also it's not an end-to-end -end explanation in the sense that even if this was true, why is there a bias towards simpler functions? So what we'd like to do is perhaps prove a mathematical theorem that, sh that shows that this is what will happen, at least in some settings, right? We, we, there's also the question of when does this thing work? What's the real, uh, what, are, what is the data set for which we expect this to work? So it, these things don't work for all data sets. I'll mention that. So I, I said neural networks work very well, but there are also problems with them. Uh, uh, there are diverse set of applications from classifying images to coding folding, uh, but uh, it's largely a heuristic uh, uh, method. Uh, there, there are many well-known limitations. They are uh, susceptible to adversarial examples. They don't work well on auto distribution. Examples require a lot of data. And there are also provable limitations. They can't learn things like parity functions. So th this cartoon is, uh, although this is for uh, machine learning, but it's even more true for um, for neural networks, I think. Um, okay, so uh, having said all that, let's see what we know about uh, about uh, the theoretical uh, understanding of uh, supervised learning. Okay, so <clears throat> so there are three basic questions: expressive power, why, and when are neural networks able to represent the data? The, the universality theorem that I mentioned uh, has the problem that it does not talk about uh, the size of the network. Um, 
So, so this, this is one question. The other is optimization. Why are neural networks able to fit the data? Why does the training loss go to zero? And the third is generalization question, which is why do they get, give a small test loss? Okay, we will formalize this question the usual computer science way that polynomial time and polynomial size are small and so on. But even in my mind, even right formalization, we may not have presently the right formalization of these problems. So even that's something one should think about. But we'll go with what uh, the community has currently settled on. Okay, so um, so I'll mention basically what we know about uh, these, this problem at present. So a couple of groups at around the same time building on previous work uh, essentially proved this result. Uh, that the gradient-based training as I described in the previous slide uh, probably converges efficiently, uh, efficient again in some polynomial sense uh, with small test error. If the neural network has the following properties, it has one hidden layer is highly overparameterized, which means it's very large compared to, uh, it's not a very well-defined term, but it's very large compared to uh, the parameters of the problem, let's say. And uh, there's a careful random initialization. Um, one can also consider the case where the limit, the M, the, the width of the network goes to infinity. And that also one can analyze, and this is called neural tangent kernel or NTK. So why does this happen? Uh, very briefly, let me just say there's, a, there's some, something like central limit theorem involved because when you, uh, even if you have a complicated random variable and you take uh, an average of lots of copies of it, you, you get normal distributions, things become simpler. So something similar happens here, although I'm not going to go into any details. So presently, this is the only setting uh, which we, for which we have uh, rigorous end-to-end -end results, okay. So in particular, the following questions are open. So if you want to analyze moderately sized networks, which are not very large, not very highly over parameterized, then we can't do that even for one hidden layer. And the reason to do that would be that these tend to be better actually compared to very large networks. The other is analysis of deeper networks. So what we are talking about is only one hidden layer so far. And uh, as you add more layers, things uh, often the networks do much better. Both their expressive power improves, also uh, generalization improves, at least uh, to some certain depth. There's a, there's a question. There's a question by uh, Tirudat Dubashi uh, for the do it as paper. Is yeah. It, is the final layer fixed randomly and not trained? Uh, you can train it too. Um, they can do both. And there's a but question. sorry. And then there's a comment about it depends upon. Uh, maybe there you can uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, the, the second part was uh, was that there is also some implicit assumption or, or it's in the setting where the weights don't change too much, the so-called lazy regime. That's co that's correct. That's where this highly overparameterized uh, thing comes in. And I forgot to put one more point, which is that the learning rate has to be very small. Right, so I put three conditions. One more, there's one more condition, is learning rate is small, mm -hmm. which guarantees what you're saying, lazy regime or NTK, yeah. Uh, does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so th this is all in lazy regime. Um, also, uh, do et al can train A, but Ellen Zhu et al don't train A. And but I'll be focusing on Ellen Zhu et al's uh, result here. Because they are the only ones that prove generalization. The other other papers mostly prove that training error goes to zero. Okay, so yeah. I'll one more, uh, one more question um, yes. from, you know, about uh, how does one decide whether one should use gradient descent or Adam or other optimization algorithms? Um, as I said, it's more of an art than a science. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you try things out. I think that that's the best answer I can give. Um, all right. So I'm going to just state this result. I'm not going to be able to prove it. Um, this is from Ellen Zhu et al. Um, so um, uh, this is again for one hidden layer neural networks. So we have this unknown function f that generates the data. f is a low complexity function. They have a specific definition of complexity, which I will not go into. But for this, let's say f is given by a polynomial of degree at most 10, and the coefficient is not too large. So that makes the complexity small, but they can handle other functions as well with low complexity. 
Then you generate the samples, as we said before, D is any distribution. Um, and then we have this neural network uh, to learn, uh, which has one neural layer, random initialization, uh, which I'll not fully describe. It has ReLU activations. So this is important. It doesn't work with other activations at present. Uh, with uh, uh, M equal to uh, one over epsilon neurons. Epsilon is any constant which will determine the final error. Uh, so, so you fix any epsilon and M has to be at least one over epsilon, omega one over epsilon. And we train using a gradient me based method with small learning rate, which is like one over epsilon M. Since M is large, uh, omega one over epsilon. It's actually, there, there are other terms that I didn't include here. So it tends to be small. So after T equal to poly one over epsilon steps with high probability, the neural network that you get has small test loss. Right? So this NT of X is the neural network at time step T and test loss tends to be very small. So I've uh, simplified the result a lot. It's much more technical but uh, this, this is the essence of it, okay? Um, so we'll now move to uh, normalizing flows. I had some proof outline, but I don't think I have time for it, so I'm gonna skip it. All right, so where are we in the talk? Uh, I, I just, just learning probability distribution, you know, generative models and uh, supervised learning neural networks and theoretical analysis of those things. Now I'm finally going to define normalizing flows, uh, which for which I needed all, all those definitions. Uh, okay. So I'm going to stick to D equal to one case. I'll make some remarks on higher D later on. So let's say X is the random variable the data which describes the data, unknown random variable. We'll assume that its support is in minus one to one interval, which is essentially without loss of generality. Um, and uh, so we'll make that assumption. Um, and again, we assume it's kind of nice. Then we have a second random variable, Z, uh, a base random variable, uh, which is going to be a standard random variable like the Gaussian, standard Gaussian, or the standard exponential distribution. So we know everything about Z. And some notation, P sub X is the density of X, P sub Z is the density of Z. And now there's this theorem in optimal transport. Uh, um, so under some regularity assumptions on X, it is known that there exists a unique invertible differentiable function F from so minus one, one to the R. So, so that, and the random variable F inverse of Z has the same distribution as X. Okay. Um, so th th this is not really a hard theorem uh, and I could have given intuition for this if I had a little bit more time, uh, but it's also not immediately obvious so probably, but it's not a hard theorem, um, but I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. So, so but this, this theorem underlies the whole construction of you know, normalizing flows. So basically, just to repeat, um, we can get X out of Z by applying a function F inverse. There's a invertible function F which with this property. And since we are in one dimension, one dimensional case, invertibility is the same thing as monotonicity. So F is a monotonically increasing or monotonically decreasing function. And we are going to assume it's monotonically increasing without loss of generality. Okay, um, so if we had such a function f, suppose we had access to this f, um, and also f in f inverse, suppose we could compute these, then we would have been able to solve the problem of learning probability distributions uh, as follows. So if you want to generate a sample of x, we simply generate a sample of uh, z and apply f inverse, and that, that gives us a sample of x. Density estimation is also easy. There's a simple uh, formula for change of using change of variables. The density of x, p x uh, at little x is p sub z of f of x times f prime of x. This is the derivative x derivative of f. So this, so this is a standard formula, uh, right? So 
if we had access to F and we could compute derivative of F, then we can also compute the density P sub X at X. So then the problem reduces to uh, estimating capital F. Okay, so uh, how do we get F, capital F? So what we have is uh, the density PZ. We know everything about Z, uh, but we only have IID samples of capital X. So how can, you, can we estimate F? There are no labels, uh, unlike in the supervised setting. So we need to measure goodness of uh, of a neural network, uh, how, how well does it fit capital F? So for that, we go back to the method of maximum likelihood from classical statistics, which basically does the following. It, uh, it, you, you work with a class of probability distributions and choose the distribution from that class that maximizes the likelihood of the observed data. So I'm going to make this precise on the next slide. And in, uh, this provably recovers the right distribution when we have sufficiently many samples. So um, let me first define the class of densities that we get in, in, for normalizing flows. So let me define P sub Fz uh, uh, is the density function of F inverse of Z, where F is a monotone function from the interval minus one, one to the X. Okay. So we take any monotone function of this type. And for that, we can define uh, the random variable f inverse of z, and that has density this, which is simply given by this formula using change of variables. Okay, so th this is the the class of random variables or so densities with which we work, which from which we try to find the one that fits the data the best. Um, okay, um, now we want to choose f that maximizes the likelihood of the data, right? So what is the likelihood? It's just simply the product of the densities uh, at the data points. So we want to maximize, we want to choose F that maximizes this or equivalently we maximize, this, maximize the log of this, which is this L of F. It's a function of F, uh, some of the logs of the uh, probabilities. So informally, uh, this, the probability this has is that um, uh, for f that maximizes L of f, uh, we expect that uh, little f tends to capital F and, uh, and the density also tends to P of x, assuming that uh, the class of densities we are looking at also has the, the target density in it. Okay. So um, let me just rewrite here the, the log likelihood using the formula that we had. So we can write it this way, uh, sum of log of uh, uh, Z density of F of XI and the sum of log of F prime of XI. So this is a function of, or functional uh, of F, L of F, right? So we want to maximize this where the space, uh, we are optimizing over uh, monotone functions F. How can we do such an optimization? So this seems a little hard, um, uh, at least in practice. Uh, one could apply things like calculus of variations, but uh, it's not very clear how to do it with real data sets. So the idea, one well, of the ideas behind normalizing flows, or much of deep learning is whenever you need a function which you don't know what to do with, or you don't know it, use a neural network, right? so which is what we do here. So we substitute n for f in the previous formula. So we get L of n, uh, the, log, the log likelihood of n is uh, the same formula as before, except n replaces f. So n, as you remember, uh, so we are working with scalars now, right? So I remove the dot product here. There's no transpose. Everything is scalar. AR is a scalar, WR is a scalar, X is a scalar. So, so n of X is just this uh, number, n prime of x, which is the x derivative of n, is uh, just this number, okay? So you can see that this is an explicit function of w and a and b. Uh, so if you take z to be standard Gaussian, uh, then the objective function becomes uh, uh, n of xi squared uh, and plus sum of log of n prime of xi. 
So LON is an explicit function and we can try to apply gradient-based optimization as we did previously for supervised learning and be done, right? But we are not really done because the function that neural networks represent are not monotone. And the whole, our whole setup depended on the function being monotone. So it does not work, it fails if you use N of X just like we did here. This thing does not work. We need to somehow ensure that N of X is monotone. Okay, uh, so this is what I just said. The neural network architecture here is does not guarantee that the function n computes is monotone because, for example, um, even though sigma is monotone, that's a ReLU, we are using ReLU or 10H, but if we make WR negative and AR is positive, then this is a decreasing function of X. Right? So in general, N of X is not a monotone, monotonically increasing function of X. So the other idea that's used in normalizing flows is to tweak the architecture so that it does give us a monotone function to or invertible function. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay. So how do we do that? Um, so that turns out to be somewhat involved. And again, I'm going to restrict to d equal to one. Um, so there are actually many methods to do that. Um, there are two classes of methods. One is uh, constraint normalizing flows, and most models are of this type. Uh, I'm going to describe one of these methods. And the other is unconstrained normalizing flows. There's only one paper that, that does this, which I'll also describe. Um, okay, so constrained normalizing flows. Um, so we will assume that sigma is strictly increasing, which is the case for most activations. Um, and what we'd like to do is if we can somehow ensure that AI and WI are positive for all I, right? Then our, our whole neural network is monotone because each individual uh, neuron or semant here gives us a monotone function uh, because WI is positive. So this WIX plus DI is, a, is an increasing function. AI is also positive and sigma is increasing. So uh, if you could ensure this somehow, then we would get at least a monotonically increasing function. So the main idea here is to just reparameterize. Instead of AI and WI in the neural network, we use AI squared, WI squared, which are always positive, whatever the values of AI and WI, right? So we define this modified neural network uh, and constraint X, um, which is, basically the same thing, except we are using AI squared and WI squared. So this is guaranteed by construction to be monotone. And then we just optimize this, uh, the, the log likelihood of uh, NC as a function of WA and B to get the trained model. And once we get NC, a trained NC, then we can use it to generate samples as we said before. We, so NC inverse, uh, given the network NC, it's easy to invert it in 1D. You can do simple binary search and invert it. So, so yes. There's a question about ready uh, by the, the, the yeah. So, so is it, you, you, can you not use it just because of practical issues or is it for analysis? There, there is a real issue. Um, um, I won't be able to go into it, but basically, yeah, I, actually I can explain. So in the, log likelihood uh, 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 expression, we had an F prime of X, right? And when we have, if, if we use a neural network, so we, we need to compute N prime of X. And if it has ReLU activation, the N prime of X becomes a discontinuous function, right? So, so then it does not work. Your, your um, loss function becomes discontinuous and the gradient-based methods don't work both in practice and uh, also in theory. So that's why we need to go with something that has at least uh, first derivative, which is continuous. Okay, um, so uh, once we have trained uh, and see, we can use it to uh, generate samples of X and also we can uh, estimate the density. There are also a couple of questions about yeah. that. So about the tra tra transformation. So 
So actually, there's an earlier one by Sandeep about if that generalizes to multivariate setting, this trans like trans it does. There, there are theorems to the, the things like uh, Nothe map and uh, Brenier's theorem. So it does and generalize. Um, and the second question on the same is by Samantha, uh, which asks, uh, how does that the choice of the base distribution affect the method? So instead of yeah, that's the, so that uh, does matter. So our theorem, which I'll hopefully state, is not about Gaussian distribution because Gaussian distribution causes issues for, for the thing. We instead use exponential distribution, which works just as well as, as far as we know in practice. But uh, normally people only use Gaussian as far as I've seen. And but there's no, there's no real good reason to stick to Gaussian. It's just something that we are used to probably. And and then there's a uh, and then there's a question. There are a couple more questions. One is about how does the monotone assumption is by Prabhu too. Uh, how does monotone assumption translate to, the, to higher dimensions? Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go into that because that's kind of complicated and uh, we don't have time for it. Uh, but uh, there are, as I said, there are things like Knothe map, Knothe's theorem, and Brainier's theorem which have various versions of um, uh, monotonicity. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's all I'll say. And, and, this, and there's a question of Pratik about, it just as non-differentiable tier zero. So Pratik, can you maybe unmute yourself and ask what the question was? Uh, no, I think he answered about Relu. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm done. Okay, so that, that, yeah, that's all. Okay, so uh, so th this thing works quite well in practice, see, even with one hidden layer neural network uh, in 1D. So here is an example of uh, uh, example run. Uh, so this is the input density and this is the output density. Okay, um, so I have about uh, how many how many minutes do I have to use? Piyush. Yes, so, 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 so we can. So we wanted to finish at seven twenty, but we can go on for a little while more because we had a lot of questions. So, uh, okay, so I'll try to finish in next uh, six seven minutes. Yeah, that's uh, seven eight minutes. Okay. So the, I I just defined one type of normalizing flows, constrained normalizing flows. The other I said is unconstrained normalizing flows, and th these are a little bit harder, uh, but unfortunately I'll have to go fast. Um, so. Uh, the, the basic observation is the monotonicity of F is equivalent to the derivative of F being positive for all X. So, so what they use is uh, instead of representing F using a neural network N, they represent F prime using N uh, with the property that N of X is greater than zero for all X. So this is how they do it. Um, N of X is uh, uh, some function phi, which I'll define below phi of uh, the neural, uh, the previous neural network that we saw. Okay, so you, you define any general neural network, but then you <clears throat> apply this function phi uh, to it. So sigma, the, the inside, the fun uh, activation inside is going to be ReLU still, uh, unlike in the previous case where it couldn't be ReLU. And phi is uh, a real to real function, which is given by this formula. Uh, it is exponential if x is less than zero and x plus one if x is greater than equal to zero. Here, here is a graph of that function. So this has several nice properties, but the main property we need to talk about here is that p of x is always greater than zero. Um, so since we have this, so n of x is always greater than zero, so f prime of x is always greater than zero. Okay. But uh, this give, might give us f prime, but uh, we, what we need for normalizing flow is f. Like, how do we get that? So it's a very simple idea again. Um, so we represented F prime using N. Uh, to get F, we just use numerical integration. Right? So, we, so this, this is a picture of how we do numerical integration, right? which we learned in high school or calc high school calculus. Um, so F of X is just uh, some step size delta times uh, the sum of F prime of minus one, F prime minus one plus delta and so on. And this is an approximation of F. Uh, and uh, since we are using neural networks, so instead of F prime, we use N here, and that gives us a new, uh, what, a new network, which I'll call NU of X. 
right? So this is really going to play the role of capital F, or uh, sorry, of F. Um, so this is, the, the, we substitute this in the log likelihood. So L of N of N U. And, uh, and so this is then a function of W, A, and B, which we can optimize using gradient based math. There are a couple more questions. So uh, yes. how, how do you go from the neural network for the derivative to the one to five prime two? From... So th this is exactly what I'm saying here in idea two or, or below this, right? Um, so we, we set up this, this function, n u of x, which is written this way, right? Delta is some number that we choose, which I'll describe later. But you fix some, delta will be some small constant, right? Let, let's say one over 100 or something. So once you have done that, then this is a well-defined uh, formula, right? So you just substitute this in the formula uh, for log likelihood, and that gives you a function of w, a, and b, which you can optimize. Yeah, and uh, given that I will have another, so, so does the does the quadrature rule matter or like? Uh, it does, it, it actually matters. So what I'm talking about here is the simple quadrature. In their paper, they use uh, something called, uh, uh, well, some more, much more sophisticated quadrature and that speeds things up, but it's harder to analyze things for that because mm -hmm. that makes things non-convex in, in the analysis. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And there is a question by Sandeep about how do the how does the approach perform in large dimensions? And there's a plus one for him, which I guess is for Sandeep's question. Yeah, I'm going to briefly touch upon that in the next slide. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so normalizing flows for d greater than one. Uh, so whatever I said, right? The the, the whole general construction I said uh, sort of more or less applies to higher dimensions, although it gets much more complicated. Um, so in particular, we know that this invertible transformation exists even in higher dimensions and has various nice properties. Uh, so using that theorem, we can try to design neural networks, but it's more complex. Um, so what do we know about it theoretically? I'll, I'll uh, talk about that in, in this slide. So first let me, so these are our results. Um, so for constrained neural uh, normalizing flows, we give evidence that uh, significant new ideas are needed even for the equal to one. So what happens is that if your network, underlying network is very large or parameterized, then, then the training fails, uh, both in theory and in practice. Right? We give theoretical reasons why it cannot work. And, um, but for if you use a network that are not very really large, then it, it does work quite well. So we, it seems like we need to understand for a supervised learning of moderate size neural networks, which has been open for quite a while. So that's why I say significant ideas are needed. Okay, so that's for constrained normalizing flows. Um, again, for d equal to one, for unconstrained normalizing flows, uh, we can analyze them uh, when they are over parameterized. Uh, and show that they learn uh, probability distributions. Now, try to maybe state the theorem if I have time. And uh, finally, for d greater than one, again, we give evidence that significant new ideas are needed. So what that means is that to uh, analyze those normalizing flows, we either need to solve supervised learning for moderate size neural networks, which is open, as I said earlier, or we must solve supervised learning for more than one neural layer, which is again open. So, so there are some, these are sort of barriers that we encountered in analyzing d greater than one. Uh, so I, I should say that for d equal to one, the problem is in some sense very simple because we can solve it using, uh, 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 at least computationally it's very simple because we can solve it using uh, histograms. But of course, it's not clear what neural networks do, normalizing flows do even in d equal to one. So that's interesting. Um, okay, so um, I can state the theorem if I have time or I can just conclude here. Uh, it's a little bit of a mouthful, so it will take me some time to state it. Yeah, yeah we can go over the theorem. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so let me backtrack. Um, so we, so this is again a simplified and formal statement. Uh, the, I'll, I'll take some liberties here. So it's not 
fully true in some sense. So you fix an epsilon greater than zero, um, fix a data distribution of random variable X and we have these samples X1 to Xn and let F be the function that we really want, uh, right? Which, so that F inverse of X gives us the, uh, the random variable Z, which in this case is exponential, not Gaussian. We cannot do it with Gaussian right now, although I think it should work even with Gaussian. Then C of F is a complexity measure which tracks how fast F oscillates. So if F varies very fast, then C of F is large. Otherwise, if it's kind of smooth, then C of F is small. And now our neural network has, uh, is overparameterized, which means that uh, M is at least C of F over epsilon squared. Number of F samples is also large, C of F over epsilon squared. And number of quadrature points is C of F over epsilon. So now if you have this much time, this number of steps in the gradient algorithm, uh, log M over epsilon squared, which should probably be theta here, not the big O. Um, then if this is the function that we obtain at time step T after applying the, neural, uh, the normalizing flow, then we have this guarantee. The probability at least 0.9, the, the KL divergence between uh, the, the tar target density and the density that the network learned is small at most epsilon. Okay, so, so they are at least close in some sense, in KL divergence sense. And using thin square, you can also show that they are close in, in the L1 sense. So there's a couple of comments, and I think we right. close that. So one is by Devdas um, uh, which uh, says that it goes against the common wisdom that need heavily over parameterized networks. Sorry, I didn't mean this result. I meant the previous one where it was the other direction for the for the constrained neural network. Uh -huh. So can you repeat the comment? I uh, what goes against wisdom, conventional wisdom. No, your previous uh, result yeah. you mentioned about constrained neural networks yeah, that yeah, do yeah. not work for over parameters. Yeah, that's right. true. That's, that's, that was surprising because we spent a lot of time. We, we, we were sure that it would work and then we kept running into trouble and then we realized it cannot work. Um, and, uh, and the last one is from Prabhu, which asks uh, about the sample complexity for generating multivariate Gaussian using uh, using uh, normalizing flow versus sparse and window. I don't know. I mean, we, we, right now our results are very um, coarse, so we can't. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we can only analyze the d equal to one, and uh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, so that's the theorem, and uh, let me just state these problems, which actually I already mentioned. Uh, so analyze normalizing flows for d equal to one constrained ones and in general for d greater than one. And both of these seem to require solving supervised learning for either moderate size networks or more than one hidden layer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, thank, let's, let's thank Navi. Uh, and uh, there's one more uh, question, last comment by from Devdas Dubashi about that the theorem seems to be about learning general functions. A general function. Uh, so, what does it have to do specifically with uh, normalizing flows? Sorry, this theorem, the main theorem. Uh, yeah, it uh, just seems to be something about learning a function with a sufficiently smooth, uh, you know, this complexity. Oh, but we have to use the, the architecture that I mentioned, right? Uh, the unconstrained normalizing flow architecture. Did I? Um, so this whole thing is for uh, unconstrained, unconstrained normalizing flow. Does it answer the question? Uh, okay, but I mean, yeah. it could be, I mean, this would be the same as trying to learn a f some other function based on learning a network for its derivative at Dendron quadrature. Uh, but we used a log likelihood which has which gives us a lot of headache uh, instead of using the other other um, loss functions. And also because of the specific form of uh, unconstrained normalizing flow, um, that is because it, uh, also the log likelihood involved F prime and F, so the derivative of network. So all those things make it quite different from supervised learning result that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
servers and you know, we are uh, we are already past time for the uh, sorry about that yeah oh, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, yeah uh, and uh, yeah, so we should be maybe thank you know, you. one minute we should start the next topic <laughs> thank you yeah, thanks thank you Uh, so Vivek, you can go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker in a minute's time. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, is Megri around? Hi, yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Can I share my screen? Yeah, please. Does it work? Yeah, you can make it full screen. Uh, full screen doesn't work um, oh, okay. on my keyboard for some reason, I don't know. Also, I think we can't see your face. Maybe you can start the video also. Let me see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's start. It's a great pleasure to introduce Melly Wang. She is one of the rising young stars in reinforcement learning. So I quickly tell you her background. She did her PhD with uh, Dimitri Barsakas in MIT and uh, uh, is now with uh, Princeton University. I believe also has uh, some affiliation with DeepMind. Uh, she has already garnered quite a few honors, like Young Researcher Prize in Continuous Optimization, which is given only once in three years. Then Princeton ACAS Innovation Award, Google Faculty Award, and the MIT Tech Review 35 under 35 Award for the China region. So today she will uh, talk about some theoretical results on model-based reinforcement learning. So before I hand over to you, Megdi, do you want to break occasionally for um, questions or should I interrupt you? Um, people will put questions on chat. Uh, feel free to interrupt me, yeah. Okay, thanks. So mm -hmm. over to you now, you can start. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, madam, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Um, can you, madam, can you make a full screen? There is a play button is there. Yes. Just yeah, that doesn't work. Whenever I do that, my, my PC will somehow end up with problems. Okay. Yeah, I, I just try to minimize the sidebar as much as I can. Oh, that works. No, just, just, just play the play, play icon. No, no, that, that doesn't work. I, my Zoom will, will just okay. fail if I do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You make it as like this. Okay. Uh, should I wait or should I start? You can start. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you very much for the kind invitation. So it's right. Okay. Okay. So it's my pleasure to present works on theoretical reinforcement learning in the applied probability society. So, um, um, so I'm, I'm with Princeton University and, and also I have a partial affiliation with Google DeepMind. So we work on, so our focus of research is to understand theoretically what's the sample efficiency of reinforcement learning and how to design optimal algorithms for learning in a real environment. Okay, so I wanna share some recent theoretical results with you guys. Okay, so um, the very basic mathematical model for reinforcement learning is, is very common. So it is the Markov decision process. So I think everyone uh, has, has known this mathematical optimization problem from early literature in operations research and in applied probability. So Markov decision process is a very basic model for sequential decision making with stochasticity. 
Okay, so uh, in the very, very basic MDP model, usually let's begin with saying that we have a finite number of possible states and we have a finite number of possible actions to choose at each possible state, okay? And uh, so at each state, upon choosing some action, we have a reward function, we have a reward. So rewards, this little r, I don't know if you can uh, see my cursor. So this little r is a function of state and actions. And let's assume for simplicity that this, this r value is always between zero and one. Okay. And the Markov decision process has its own law, law of transition, which is a collection of transition probabilities. So from each state and action, there is a distribution of the next state. Okay, so the optimization problem is we want to find an optimal policy, which is a mapping from the state space to the space of actions. And we want to maximize the value of the policy, which is the expectation of cumulative returns to be collected on the random path generated by this Markov decision process. Okay, so this is the very basic model for reinforcement learning. Okay, so if we know the rewards, we know all the reward values and we know all the transition probabilities, once we know that, this becomes an optimization problem, right? Then we can solve it in many different ways. We can do value equation, we can do Q learning, which is a stochastic approximation equation. Uh, well, we can even formulate this as a linear program and solve it directly. Okay, so notice that I have a word tabular here. So tabular is really a jargon in the reinforcement learning community. So by tabular, usually we imply that we're working with discrete state space and discrete action space. And also we do not have any additional assumption beyond this Markov decision process. Okay, so tabular means that we have no other structure knowledge. Okay, so first let's review what do we know about tabular MDP, so which is the finite state, finite action, the simplest case. Okay, so we pose this as a learning problem. Consider a simple setting in which we have a generative model this is again a, a reinforcement learning jargon, which means a simulator. Okay, let's say that we have a generative model or a simulator so that from any given state and action pair, we can generate a random sample of the next state. So this generative model can replace the transition probabilities. So we can estimate the optimal policy without knowing the transition prob probabilities as long as we have a generative model. Okay, and in this case, so the sample complexity for solving tabular MDP is already known. So uh, I think we start with the lower bound. So there is this information driver limit proved by a bunch of DeepMind folks a few years ago showing that if we want to find an absolute optimal policy, no matter what we do, we are going to need the following sample size. And the sample size depends linearly on the number of states times the number of actions, okay? It also depends uh, as a cubic function of the discount factor. Okay, so in the recent couple of years, so we actually were able to close the gap between upper and lower bounds. So we were able to actually develop the sampling based algorithm that can achieve the information driver limit for the first time. Okay, so actually there is, actually there exists now, now more than one algorithm to guarantee finding a near optimal policy with high probability within 
a sample size that is super close to the theoretical lower bound. Okay. And on a, another related notion for sample efficiency is regret. Regret means that I have to learn to make decisions on the fly. And we care about the cumulative errors, which is the regret we make during the online learning process. And in this case, there exists lower bound that again depends uh, on the square root of number of states times number of actions. Okay, so uh, I'm showing you these results because they are the very basic results for the finite state, finite action tabular problem. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a sense on how the dimension S and A play their roles in the sample complexity and regret for reinforcement learning. Okay, so I want to talk about model-based reinforcement learning. So what this means? So this is a figure I, I stole from the famous Sutton Bartle book on RL. So this is the diagram of model-based RL. And if some uh, people in the audience come from control, you might tell me that this is not RL, this is really just model predictive control. So model-based reinforcement learning is in some way pretty close to model predictive control. So what happens is the overall learning process is going to be iteratively collecting experience from by acting in the real world. And the agent after collecting in experiences is going to somehow fit a model. And after fitting a model to the experiences, the agent will make decisions. So he's going to do planning using the learned model. And so he's going to compute value functions or policy functions for the next data collection period using the learned model. And then he's going to collect data again. Okay. And more precisely, we mean that we want to fit a model. So this model can be as general as the collection of transition probabilities for Markov decision process. Okay. So in a tabular case, the model is going to be the collection of all the probabilities. So we fit a model to experiences. So our experiences is going to be the state action, state action transition trajectories that have been collected in the core, during the course of online reinforcement learning. Okay. And then we care about, okay, how, how do we fit a model? And can we come up with regret guarantee? Okay. And, and now, since that we're calling with, now, now that our focus is a model, right? So our model doesn't have to be as generic as a finite state, finite action MDP, because we do know that if we discretize the state space in a naive way, we're going to suffer the curse of dimensionality, right? So now by fitting a model, we actually allow a richer class of models for reinforcement learning beyond tabular Markov decision process. Okay, so, uh, so, so next I wanna give you some, I would say toy examples to show you that how one can efficiently learn a model for this Markov decision process while acting in the real world with provable regret. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, so a uh, rigorous definition of regret is the following. So say that we have a learning algorithm. Okay, right. So the regret by definition is the difference between the theoretical maximal value that could possibly be earned, which is this V star S zero, optimal value from the initial state S zero, okay? and the sum of actual returns collected on the trajectory, okay? And this definition applies to finite horizon episodical reinforcement learning in which the agent 
plays the game episode by episode, and there are going to be n episodes, and each episode consists of h time steps or h individual decisions. Okay, so the regret is an overall a function of either n or t. Okay. So I do need to mention that there exists a lot of works and actually I think there are more, many more papers coming out in the recent couple of years studying the regret of reinforcement learning using different algorithms under different assumptions. Okay, I just want to give you a sample of the result. Okay, so um, a generic framework for model-based reinforcement learning is known as upper confidence reinforcement learning. So in some ways, it's very, it can be viewed as, a de, uh, as derived from upper confidence bandit algorithms. Okay. So now what's different, what's different between RL and bandit is, so now when we construct a confidence set, we are always going to be construct a confidence set of the unknown transition model and we construct such a confidence set based on experiences, based on the sample trajectories, okay? And once we have this confidence set, we are going to do optimistic planning, meaning that we are going to look at all possible transition model P in the confidence set B, okay? And we are going to be optimistic. We are going to choose the most optimistic policy pi that maximize the best value corresponding to the best instance in the confidence set. Okay, as you can see, it, this is actually in some way very similar to upper confidence bandit, except for that our objective is the value of a policy instead of the value of a single decision. Okay. So now let's try to uh, make this more specific. First, let's consider a, a very basic set of systems. So what if we work with finite horizon deterministic transition system? Okay, so the reward is going to be deterministic and the transition function f from state action to state is going to be a deterministic function. And now in the reinforcement learning world, we want to learn the optimal policy. Okay, so we want to solve this optimization problem, but we will not know the reward function little r, and we will not know the transition function f. We have to learn those unknowns by acting in the real world. Okay, but we're going to assume a little bit of structure knowledge. So suppose that the only knowledge we have is a metric, meaning that we have a measure of distance in the state action space. And our, our assumption is we work with the class of Lipschitz continuous transition models. Okay, so now you can see that, okay, we work with control systems that are deterministic. We do not know the transition functions but we have the assumption that I have a known metric and the system is in some way continuous with respect to that metric. And my question is how fast can we learn to optimally control such a system? So this is a simple example in which we actually don't have probability yet. Okay, and algorithm turns out to be very simple. It's, an, it's I would say a, a special case of the abstract upper confidence model-based RL algorithm. Okay, so we can write it in a way that mimics Q learning. Okay, so say that we are at the beginning of a new episode and we have stored all the data we have collected so far in a buffer. So let's call this buffer DN, stands for data after an episode. Okay, so now we want to use the data we have to do Q iteration or to, to solve the Bellman equation approximately. Okay, so since we, we don't really know the transition function, 
we're basically going to do a nearest neighbor Q learning update. So we can do that easily because this is a deterministic system. We, have, we don't have to estimate expectations. So if I want to know the transition from this state, I, I will just look for some neighbor of this state and use the transition that we have observed at the neighbor as a proxy. Okay, but we are going to do a bit more than that. So we want to do optimistic upper confidence planning. So we're going to add a bonus term, which is this distance term on each possible neighbor. So that for each possible neighbor, we compute an upper bound for the Q update. And then we're going to take the sharpest upper bound from all possible neighbors, meaning that we're going to take mean over all data we have collected in the data buffer to get the sharpest upper bound for each Q value. So by iterating this process, which is really Q iteration with nearest neighbor search with a little bit of optimism, okay? So we can always compute the best Q values based on the current data, which allows us to choose actions in the next episode. And then we're going to iterate this process. Okay. Maybe uh, can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, sure. Yeah. One question is from Shalab. Uh, he says, is F known here? F is not known. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I had this F of S prime and A prime. So this particular transition is known because it is in the data buffer. Okay. So this overall F function is not known except for the state actions that we have visited. Okay, so we know a few points yeah, of this F and we collect more data points as we go. Okay, great question. Yes. Yeah, there are a couple more now. The one is mm -hmm. uh, from Devlet Dubashi. He said, this is, seems similar in spirit to the hierarchical learning in Lipschitz managed by Bubeck et al. Uh, I think so, but I think, actually, I think this is much simpler than that. Okay, okay another question from Alexandre Cloutier. What is mm -hmm. the question with Q learning with nearest neighbors by Shaw and Z, Europe's uh, 2018? Uh, I think actually uh, this, paper, this paper came out earlier and the assumptions are different. And also uh, this particular result I'm talking about has an explicit regret. And I think that newest paper, to my best knowledge, is more about sample complexity. So sample complexity and regret are very different notions because in dealing with regret, we have to deal with dependent data and uh, we have to uh, do optimism. And we, there are a bunch of things that we need to do. And if we simply try to think about Q learning with nearest, nearest neighbor as a stochastic approximation algorithm, then it's mostly about convergence and convergence rate. But in regret, you can see that the data collecting distribution is changing and is adaptive. And so the nature of the results are different. So if, if that's the paper uh, I have in mind, I'm not exactly sure whether we're talking about the same paper, but uh, probably the difference is one is about online learning, the other one is about learning with a simulator. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, I think that's all for the Great, thank you. Okay, so what can be proved? So we can show that after K episode, that algorithm learns with a regret. And you can see this regret, well, depends on horizon, depends on this big D, which is diameter of the state space with respect to the known metric. It depends on Lipschitz constants. It depends on the number of episodes. And also it depends on this little D here which is the doubling dimension of the state action joint space. Okay, so, um, so first, such a regret doesn't appear to be a good regret because you, we can see that as little d is large, this regret is close to linear. So this is actually a regret that actually suffers from the curse of dimensionality, okay? But we can actually also prove a lower bound showing that this regret upper bound is minimax optimal in the sense that if we work with continuous deterministic 
and con and 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 the sorry Lipschitz continuous systems. And if we don't have other additional structural knowledge to begin with, we can't do better than this regret dot. Okay. And what's interesting is the notion of doubling dimension. So doubling dimension, oh, which is really just the dimension. So it tells us what is the, if the intrinsic dimension of a space once we are given a distance or a metric. But we want to know that doubling, doubling dimension is usually significantly smaller than the raw dimension of the data, okay? For example, if you think about the states as raw pixel images of a video game. So those images, we can view them as lie on a smooth manifold and this doubling dimension is going to be the intrinsic dimension of the manifold, but the raw dimension could be the number of pixels, okay? So in some way, this algorithm is automatically learning the manifold at the same time when solving the, con the optimal control, the dynamic programming problem. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to know the doubling dimension to begin with. It can adapt automatically to the underlying latent structure of the state space. Okay, so this is one illustration. So if we work with the class of continuous systems, then we can utilize this structural knowledge, build it in, in model-based RL, and we can get provably small regret. Okay, so now I'm going to change the gear. So now let's work with stochastic transition systems. Okay, so uh, in RL, typically whenever we work with state and actions, we're going to featureize state and actions into some vector, some numeric vectors, okay? So we can think about a feature vector of a state. We can view that, view it approximately as, for example, um, the, the second to last layer embedding of a neural network, okay? So suppose that we can vectorize states and state action pairs into vectors. Okay, and also we're going to suppose that the, the feature vectors we are given are sufficiently expressive so that we can embed the unknown transition kernel, this unknown P into a lower dimensional space spanned by the feature vectors. So this is actually an assumption which implies that we can predict state to state transition using a linear model. So that's really what the assumption is. Okay. And it also basically saying that we can embed the unknown transition kernel into a finite matrix. Still a strong assumption, but it can be useful in actually a lot of occasions already. Okay. So under this assumption, we have feature map and we can embed unknown transition kernel into a matrix. Now we can do a model-based RL algorithm. We call it matrix RL. And again, what we can do is very similar to bandit. And in this case, it's actually very similar to linear bandit. So we can construct a confidence ball around the estimated transition kernel. And then we use the confidence ball we have constructed to compute optimistic Q function values. Okay, so this is the key step. And then we choose actions according to the new Q value estimates. Okay, and in this case, one can show that we can actually get much tighter regret. Okay, so uh, one can show that the regret now depends on root t, which is min max optimal uh, for sure. And also what's interesting is it depends linearly on the dimension d. So it depends linearly on the dimension of the feature map. So this regret is actually um, not entirely minimax optimal. The dependence on H horizon is not optimal, but other dependence are optimal. Okay, so it shows us one way to think about stochastic transition systems. If we have good features and if we can somehow embed the unknown system dynamics into the feature space, then we can learn with proof or regret that depends linearly on dimension of feature map. And this result can be generalized to reproducing kernel space. 
Okay. So now suppose that we don't have the feature map, but we have a kernel function to begin with. So I can measure the kernel similarity between any two state action pairs. Okay. And our generic assumption is that the transition kernel here, the transition kernel P belongs to a product Hilbert space spanned by uh, the kernels. And then we can uh, actually translate that matrix RL algorithm into a kernelized version. And in this case, we can show that the regret of learning a kernel transition systems depends on this. So again, it's a root T regret. And also it depends on the effective dimension of the kernel space. Okay, so the true dimension of a kernel space is infinite, but the effective dimension of a kernel space depends on the data and it's usually something finite. And the regret also depends on the Hilbert space norm of the underlying transition kernel. Okay, so this is uh, another uh, toy example in which we can handle reinforcement learning when we know that the model transition model can be expressed using good feature maps. Okay. So uh, now I think the, the real meat I want to talk about is I, I want we want to be able to generalize from those specific model classes. So can we do something more generic? Can we learn a more generic model? And also can we fit the generic model in a more generic way? So to talk about that, I wanna bring your attention to a very recent uh, advance of reinforcement learning by DeepMind, so mu zero. So, uh, so we started working on this uh, a while ago, but mu zero was recently accepted to nature, I think uh, in the past months, but the paper has been under review for a long time. So mu zero is the state of art deep RL algorithm, okay? So it is a single algorithm that can solve more than 60 games and then can beat the best player in each of the game. Okay, so, so why is this a, a surprising result? So we know that for them a goal has been solved many times, right? Demand first proposed uh, alpha go and then alpha zero. But alpha go and alpha zero are specific to two person turn based zero uh, sum game, okay? And so if you're familiar with the deep RL world, so there are going to be a, a bunch of algorithms on GitHub and uh, on, on open AI, and some of the algorithms work on some of the problems. But to, to really make general AI possible, we, we want, uh, we actually hope to eventually have a single algorithm that can learn to solve games with different natures. And the mu zero is an important step towards this goal. Okay, so you can see that mu zero actually can solve all the Atari video games, and then can also solve chess, shogi, and go. So those games are of very different natures. Okay, so mu zero is a model-based RL algorithm. So it's it's general be, because it doesn't know the game, the rules of the game to begin with. So it automatically learns the rule or learns the transition model of the game and the plan using the learned model. So it is a powerful algorithm because it is model-based. It tries to learn a model without knowing the model to begin with. Okay. And a very important, um, a very important feature of mil zero is it doesn't try to fit a model to predict useless quantities of the game. It only try to predict quantities that are central to the game, which are values and policies. Okay, so actually I think this is a subtle point that I want to bring to your, to your attention. So in deep RL, whenever we do model-based RL, okay, a, a pra the, pra the common practice is we try to fit a transition model. So whenever we are given a state action pair, we can predict the next state 
Okay. So this is actually what we implicitly did in the previous two result. Okay, in the nearest neighbor one, I use the nearest neighbor to predict the next state. Okay, in, in, the, in the matrix RL algorithm, we try to parameterize the transition kernel with a matrix, and that matrix can be used to feed the data and predict the next state. Okay, so state action to state prediction used to be the common practice for model-based RL, because that's what we do or what we fit in order to learn the model. But mu zero does something very different. Okay, mu zero does value targeted regression. Okay, the difference is, is we don't try to predict the next state. I'm going to begin with the current state of action and we have a current value estimate. Then we're going to fit the transition model to predict the next value, okay? So that's the major difference. We try to use value as a target. We don't use state as the target, okay? So why is this important? So because, for example, if we think about a video game, if I want to predict the next state, the next state can be an entire image and most of the pixels of the image could be background, which are not related to the game. So if we try to learn to predict the entire image, we are going to need tons of data and a lot of training power and a lot of tuning to predict each image precisely. So that's going to be another sub problem, which is also hard. But if we have a value function and I want to simply predict the next values of the state, then we are going to be predicting one dimensional variable. This is a much simpler model fitting task. It can be, it requires significantly less data and it generalizes much better, right? But the difficulty is we don't really know the value function. We want to learn the value function, okay? So if we know the value function, we don't really need to learn the model, right? So can we learn to, can we learn the transition model while learning the value function? So that's the key question we ask. And that's what made mu zero successful. So now the assumption we have is we work with a general class of transition models. So we have, we have this capital P, which is a general class. We know that the true transition model belongs to this class. So we, we know the transition class, but the transition class doesn't have to be a particular linear model. Or it doesn't have to be a particular parameterized model. We can view it as a general class or we can view it as a class of transition models that are expressible by a certain neural network architecture. Okay. So starting from this general transition model class, we're going to be, to be building our confidence set. So we're still going to be building the confidence set by using what we know from regression. Okay. So um, for each possible transition model, this P prime is a possible candidate model. Okay. So we can compute its value prediction error. Okay. So say that my current value estimate is VT, right? So I know this value function and I know this transition model. Then from a given S and A, we can predict the value of next state, right? And in the real data, we observe the true next state. So we also observe the value of the true next state. Okay. So then we could construct the regression loss function. We simply are doing least square regression to fit our prediction to the observed value of next state. Okay. And then the confidence set is going to be the, a set of candidate models with small least square with small squared prediction error. This is very simple, just, just regression loss, okay. And what's tricky is the value target VT is the value estimate of learned by our algorithm. So this VT is actually a changing target. Okay, so that's the subtlety here. And here is the full algorithm. So it's a little bit, uh, I, I think my slide is, uh, is too dense. But uh, I just want to show, say that what's going on is, 
So say that my transition model is parameterized by theta, okay? Then the key of the algorithm is value targeting regression. We are really trying to fit the transition model or the parameter theta by doing least square regression and by constructing confidence set using least square regression laws. Okay. And then again, we do optimistic planning by picking the most optimistic policy corresponding to the confidence set of transition models. So what's really tricky here is when we do model fitting, we're doing value targeting regression and the value target, this V hat here is being updated as the algorithm runs. Okay, so the algorithm is actually doing two things. It's learning the optimal value using the policy planned using the learned model, but the learned model is learned using the adaptively changing values. Okay, so, that, so that's the tricky part. Okay, so what's really uh, interesting is the proof somehow works out beautifully, even though the algorithm seems to be actually a little bit unexpected, intuitively speaking, okay. So we can show that, okay, the regret of this algorithm, we call it upper confidence RL value target regression, VTR. So the VTR algorithm achieves a regret. And again, the regret depends square root on the number of episodes of K. And also it depends on square root of the alluder dimension of the model class. And also the log covering number of the model class. So they can be viewed as just two different notions of dimensions, okay, for the generic class of transition models. Okay, so this is actually a very strong result because we can now say that you can give me a class of transition models. And if that's the structural knowledge we have, we can design a value target regression based RL algorithm to learn to find the optimal model and the optimal policy with regret depending on dimensions of the model class. Okay. So, uh, so to hey, illustrate Mary, can, special... Mary, can we break for a few questions? Uh, actually, this is my last slide. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I'll stop from here. So uh, we can think of, we can do some special cases. So for example, if my model class is a class of linearly parameterized model, okay. And say that uh, I have a parameter theta of dimension D. In this case, the regret becomes just d times root t times root h cubic. And also, if the model class is this class of sparse linear transition models, then the dependence on d reduces to dependence on root ds. Okay, so one can try to uh, uh, specify this regret for other particular model classes. So those are two examples, I think, we'll, which will illustrate how the actual regret will look like when we have a specific model. So um, yeah, actually I do have more slides, but I don't think I can finish them. So I'm going to end here. Okay, so I, I talk about this part. <laughs> okay, so basically model-based RL, model learning and regression can be made efficient for online reinforcement learning. Okay, so we can handle linear models and nonlinear models depending on the structural knowledge we have. It's possible to design model based RL with strong generality. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yeah. yeah, I'll just read out the questions in the chat box. So, first is by Avishek Gupta. He asked, is it natural to think of feature spaces of state or state action spaces? will form Hilbert spaces. Yeah, that's a very good question. So basically, um, I wouldn't say, we cannot say that a state space is a Hilbert space because Hilbert space is, is a space of functions. Okay, but we can think about transition function or Q functions or the transition operator to be preserving a Hilbert space. Okay, does that make sense? So uh, in some way, this is really pretty similar to uh, 
all the things we do in function approximation in machine learning, right? In machine learning, if I want to predict what, y given x, and if we are doing kernel methods, essentially the assumption is the, the function, the, the conditional expectation of y given x belongs to a Hilbert space. Or if it doesn't belong to a Hilbert space, then we can also provide approximation guarantee. So I would say that the Hilbert space approximation, sorry, the Hilbert space assumption is really an assumption that guarantees uh, exact uh, function approximation using kernel methods. But um, to be as generous as possible, we can also do I mean, broader assumptions to allow me specified kernel space. Thank you. There's a question from Hemchandra. I think this is about uh, your comment that you are learning the value function. And he asked, don't, uh, he says, kernel methods do this, question mark. So I guess the question is, don't kernel methods also do this? Like which, like which kernel methods? Well, I mean, that method is based on kernel method, right? Kernel methods are for, I mean, uh, our method is one of kernel methods, yes. But ours was the first kernel method with provable regret for reinforcement learning. Uh, that, yeah, sorry. Um, Maybe Himchandra, do you want to elaborate on your question? Or... Oh, no, I think uh, whatever she mentioned, I think this is what I had in mind. This is fine. Okay, okay thanks. So the thanks. next question, there are a couple of more questions. Then, sorry, you were saying something? Uh, no, I just said that. Uh, uh, thanks. This is uh, this is what I had in mind. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is from Devdat Dubashi. So do you need both types of dimensions in that bound, which is eluder and the covering number? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I think that dependence is tight. I would say at least for 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 many uh, model classes that we know it might not be tight for every single model class. For example, in the sparse linear case, that two dimensions will give us a root ds dependence. And that root ds is actually a lower bound in sparse bounded. So I would say in, in that case, I would say the, the eluder dimension is the dimension, uh, characterize the dimension for exploration, but the log covering number characterize the dimension I would say the, the, the learning dimension or the, or the complexity of the object. So both of them are needed for sparse online bandit. So I, I think that's a, a toy example for me to think about. So I think that dependence is sharp if we want to have a general result, but I think it could be improvable in some special cases. The next question is by Prateek. Uh, is all, all of these regret based ideas and bounds are the same ideas from that of Online convex optimization. That's the question. Well, I, I would say like uh, in reinforcement learning, it's, it's very different because we are working with a transition function. And whenever we, we make a decision, the decision is going to impact the, ret the returns and observations in many follow-up steps. But in online optimization, the bandit is actually a very simple problem because whenever we make a decision, the decision will immediately generate a return. And that's it. And in the next round, we can start from, we can have a fresh start. But in reinforcement learning, it's a control problem, right? It's, it's, it's like, for example, you, you, like when we search in a maze, if I make a wrong decision at the beginning, I, I might just lose the entire game, right? Does that make sense? So having this state transition system generates a lot of difficulty. And that's really why reinforcement learning is, uh, I would say, uh, is an independent area. It's not derived from online learning. Reinforcement learning is about how to learn to control and control is a problem that's very different from just pure optimization. I would say like online optimization and optimization are very nice mathematical abstracts, ab abstractions or simplifications, but control a complex nonlinear system or complex dynamics itself could be a harder problem. And learning to control is in some way different or harder than learning to optimize a simple function. So the next question is by, from Satyam Verma. Metric-based UCRL seems similar in functioning as UCT by L. Coxis et al. with an additional information, 
information of existence of a matrix is is it so or are there any other major differences uh, i would say upper confidence methods follow pretty much the same diagram i i showed the basic idea in, in the very early slide but i'm not exactly sure what what is uct Hello, Mr. Satyam, can you uh, respond to that? Yeah. So basically, in the paper, they are applying upper confidence bounds. Uh, oh, you mean Monte Carlo tree search, right? Yeah, by the, in this paper by Foxes, they basically wanted to uh, predict uh, uh, the Q values and state action values. So on the when you, the basic idea of Vanilla Monte Carlo, where they randomly sample any of the actions, they replace that by using this upper confidence bound. On the Q values. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, good, good. That, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, good. So uh, I would say, I mean, there exists more than one upper confidence area algorithms, and the upper confidence tree search is one of them for a particular tree search problem. So, so the ma the metric area algorithm is a, is another one of upper confidence area that applies to systems with a metric. Okay, but uh, but in reality, actually, there. Are, there actually exists other earlier upper confidence area algorithm, even for the tabular case. So I, I wouldn't say like that they are definitely related because they all follow the upper confidence basic idea, but how to utilize the structure, either the tree structure or the metric structure or other linear structure, so, or hierarchical structure. So how to actually utilize that structure and build it in, in the abstract framework with proof of regret, I think that will require a case by case analysis. But the, the, I think the baseline idea of upper confidence learning is the same. And it comes from upper confidence, upper confidence bandit. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like there are no other questions. So let's thank Megidi for a fantastic talk. Uh, let me clap on behalf of everybody. Thank you very much. I guess that's the end of today's session. I think, yeah, it's worth mentioning to all the people in, from India that the next talk is at 9 a.m. tomorrow. So it's a little early in the morning. Uh, hope you can make it. Dave, that for you, it's going to be even more early. I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone.